Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey guys, welcome to episode 235 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy. I'm a... Is it over here? Oh, sorry guys. My phone was on. Apologies. Uh, so episode 235 of the Team House. We're here with our guest tonight, Brent Tucker. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. Uh, first thing I just want to tell you guys real quick about sponsor of tonight's show, uh, Dark State. If you guys are a fan of Tom Clancy or Jack Carr or Vince Flynn, which I know a lot of our listeners are, then you'll love Dark State. It's book one in the Jason Trapp action thriller series, which is available on Audible and Amazon Kindle. It's about Jason Trapp, who is betrayed uh, a betrayed CIA operative who is a feared assassin, but someone sold him out and he lost everything and everyone. And as America reels from the deadliest terrorist attacks it's ever witnessed, Trapp's personal vendetta leads him right back to where he started duty to his country the violence the terror the assassination of his partner it's all connected with 15,000 reviews and an average of 4.5 star ratings on amazon the book is gripping and thrilling if you're an audio fan which i assume many of you are uh, since you listen to this show the audiobook really does bring the story alive in a dramatic fashion so please head to audible or kindle and uh, check it out now you can get your copy of dark state book one in the jason trap series so with that said, Brent, again, uh, thank you for being on the show tonight. Really appreciate you joining us on a Friday evening. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I, I truly do appreciate it. So, uh, again, because I, I got a little distracted in the beginning, uh, Brent uh, is a 20-year veteran of Army Special Operations. He served in 20th Special Forces Group, and then he served in Delta Force, deploying to Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, today, he runs uh, the First Responder Coffee Company, and he's also the co-host of the Anti-Hero Podcast. Uh, we're really happy to have you here today, Brent. And, uh, you know, I'll kind of start it off from the top, asking the same question I ask all of our guests about their origin story. If you could tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what your upbringing was like, and sort of how that took you on a path towards the military. Yeah, um, the uh, I, I grew up in a small town in Florida, uh, Sanford, Florida, working in a family business. We own you know, Tucker's Farm and Garden Center that my grandfather started. Um, that was I was one of the few people who didn't want to leave my small town. Um, and I just wanted to work in the family business. Uh, you know, my I feel like my my path in life was was already set and I was more than happy to go down that path. Um, I definitely wasn't a uh, um an adrenaline junkie as a kid. I was a pretty quiet kid. Uh, so definitely not someone you would have, uh, you, you would have pegged for, for anything in the special operations realm or even leaving town at, at any <laughs> point. So, so how did that happen? I mean, if you were on this track of like going on, taking over the family business. Yeah. Um, so the September 11th happened. I mean, I, I had, it's it's crazy. September tenth, se September tenth. I'm uh, twenty years old. You know, still chugging down that that same path uh, that I, that I was on as a as a little kid. September eleventh happened, and uh, you know, it, it changed it changed my world the same way it changed a lot of people's world. Um, I uh, I knew I wanted to do something. Uh, uh, I I I made a, a decision that day that I I kind of would make time and time again throughout my my military career when I when I had to come to make a, dis, a big decision which was I, I didn't want to live a life with regrets you know I didn't want to be I didn't want to be 70 years old you know looking back and said man when I was 20 our, our country got attacked almost 3,000 people died and I felt like I should have done something but mm, I just played it safe and stayed in my small town um that that honestly is the um I mean, there's the genesis right there. That that line of thinking started it. Uh, I I raised my hand. Uh, it took me till September 27th to actually uh, sign the paperwork, um, and off I went. The and I and I only meant to uh, to to do is you know a, a four year stint and then and come right back to uh, to my small town. And yeah, as the saying goes, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Uh, I couldn't have been any more wrong. 
and I continued to be wrong about my career uh, <laughs> as as it progressed. So, so what did you uh, en enlist as, as far as like your MOS? What what was kind of like your plan going into the military? The one that God laughed at, of course. Yeah, when when I I knew nothing about the military, and I mean. Well, next to nothing. My dad would take me to, to air shows. My, my dad wanted to be a, a, a fighter pilot so bad, I guess, when he was uh, in his late teens. Uh, then eyesight got him, and so he didn't, he didn't get a chance to, to chase that dream. So I definitely grew up in a military-friendly family. You know, we watched war movies. You know, my dad made us watch all the Vietnam documentaries, and I loved it. Um, so we were, we were a military-friendly family, but – no one was talking about joining and I had no idea what I was going to join. So um, a good friend of mine uh, that I went to high school with Jessica Butters, her dad was, was a, I, all I knew is that he was in the military. I, I knew nothing more than that. Um, come to find out he was a CW four at a uh, national guard unit, a national guard air defense artillery unit um out of daytona beach so he was the first he was the only person i, I knew so I, I went to him and said hey uh you know our country got attacked i want to do something about it and so I, I came to him he gave me pretty good advice uh he's like hey uh i'm in the national guard um i think you should do that you'll get a chance to fight you'll get called up um but uh but you know you don't have to go away for four years sounded like a good plan to me sounded like i was going to get what i wanted which was to deploy um and so i went to the recruiter that he recommended me to go to and for a guy who wanted to join the, the military and fight i got put in air defense national guard which may not have seen a lot of action so that was that was uh, it took me about a year to to well probably took it took it took less than a year for me to figure that out. Um, but, you know, figuring it out is one thing, but doing something about it is is is, is another. So as soon as uh, as soon as I got a basic in AIT, we did get mobilized to go to the invasion of Iraq. And we sat around for like six months in Fort Bliss and um at that point, we had a, a sister battery coming back from Afghanistan. And so I couldn't wait to talk to those guys to see what war was like. And uh, I asked them, and uh, they did like a 14-month deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, and I found out that... Was all this they a, did was a, pa a Patriot missile battery that you were with, Brent? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. It, uh, so that would have been um, a part of 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 the unit i me in particular i was in uh short range air defense which was stinger missile operator okay so cool. or stingle yeah so shoulder fired stinger missiles 14 mike which eventually became 14 sierra um because i had to go to the a little bit longer course to do the uh the avengers mm -hmm. like that that uh humvee with the 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 four missiles uh on each side of the turret so that's a the avenger is so that's that's what i went to school for but when those guys went overseas for 14 months and came back they just guarded the gates that was all they did they did nothing to guard the gates um which which was my worst fear come true i kind of eventually was slowly figuring out i don't think the taliban has a lot of helicopters to shoot down and i'm not sure my skill set will be utilized in the war on terror um so i asked those guys and said hey what uh like then who was doing things and uh they 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 told these stories that were probably a little bit true but uh a little bit embellished they'd be like oh man these special forces guys these green braves would would come on to uh would come to our come to our gate with blood all over their humvees and i'd have to be like hey sergeant uh i need your ids and they'd be like f you just <laughs> open the gate and so I was like, so what'd you do? It was like, well, he, I opened the gate. What do you, what'd you expect me to do? And I was like, man, uh, and a part of me was like, those guys kind of sound like assholes. And the other part of me was like, those guys sounded really cool. <laughs> so the, uh, um, I eventually found out about 20th special forces group, which is a national guard group. Um, and that started really my, my, my whole first fight 
trying to trying to do that because we were we were mobilized at the time, getting ready to go, and that was the nail in the coffin. It was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. Um, and so it's very difficult as a National Guardsman who's already mobilized, and we went through the whole mobilization process. And what you know, we're supposed to be, uh, even though we didn't leave when we were supposed to, they were going to just kind of hold us in this limbo as a mobilized unit they could call any time. Um, and so we sat there for months at, at El Paso waiting for a call that never came. Um, so I started fighting with my my company leadership then telling me, hey, I want to go to Special Forces. I want to go to the National Guard, uh, to 20th Group. Um, they kept saying no. They, they told me all sorts of lies like, well, you have to be an E5 to, to go be a Green Beret. So you'll have to wait a few years. Um, yeah. A, I've been just talked to a few more people, found out that wasn't true. You know, I mean, just a 20th group when in a weird way has a lot of like with other National Guard units has a lot of myths like mm-hmm. surrounding it. Right. Um, and you're like, oh, well, you can't go to 20th group because you have to be, you know, a an active duty special forces guy first. And when they come out, that's how they go to 20th group. I mean, just all sorts of things that just weren't true. Um, I eventually found, I don't know if you guys remember this. You guys remember the, uh, AKO white pages. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's how I found my 20th group recruiter. I went to the AKO white pages and I Googled, uh, 20th special for Googled, probably went, uh, searched, uh, 20 special forces. And I actually found a recruiter number. Uh, out of Ocala, Florida, which would have been the closest one to me. So I'm still deployed or mobilized in in Texas, and I call him, and uh, I still remember the guy who picked up because I ended up, yeah, he was a support guy there and and was a recruiter. He picks up the phone, Sergeant First Class Carry, and uh, and I was like, hey, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Private First Class Tucker, and I I want to be a Green Beret. And he asked me like two quick questions. Awesome. Uh, like, yeah, how long you've been, he was like, private first class, you know, where are you at? I told him, he's like, how long have you been in? Um, and I told him and he basically goes, uh, call me back in like a year and then hangs up the phone. <laughs> and again, I was like, man, these guys are kind of dicks. <laughs> I, th- I think maybe I'm a dick, but that's like, I don't know. I kind of want to like, I, I love that. Like you're not good enough and you have to prove yourself and you know, this, yeah, it's like you know, fight club. Everyone, you got to come and stand out in front of the door and wait, wait your turn. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not this. Everyone gets a trophy mentality. I can't can't wait to welcome you. You know, I you know, I I I, I enjoyed that. We 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 demobilized a few short months later. Uh, I I called him right back um, and talked to someone else on the phone who was a little more welcoming and told my sob story. They said, you know what, come over here and do a. Uh, do a small tryout and we'll, and, and we'll see. Um, so I show up knowing absolutely nothing to this small tryout. I knew they told me to get ready to, to ruck and do a PT test at least. And so I said, okay. And I showed up not knowing anything, but knowing the, Hey, like all I know about soldiering is like boots and uniform matters. Uh, and I'm not a green beret yet. So I better show up with, with polished boots and a press uniform. Uh, and I did that and I was immediately scolded for it and told to get into to PTs <laughs> and uh, don't, don't ever wear those around here again unless there's some sort of reward ceremony going on. And I said, <laughs> OK, I like this place already. Um, I did the uh, I did the PT test and the and the ruck and uh, I, I did very well on it. Um, they said, hey, we want to bring you over to our program and send you a selection as soon as possible. Go back and tell your unit that you want to uh that you want to transfer over here and that's where the real fight kind of started you know they 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 had already been giving me a bunch of you know uh slow rolling me and now they just simply told me nope uh we're not going to send you but like before the mobilization we sent a couple guys over there they never make it you know i'm don't waste our time with the paperwork don't waste your time we're just not going to send you over there um so i carried that message back to 20th group and uh, the, the sergeant major uh, laughed at it and said, hold on, I'll, I'll make a phone call. They can't. It's it's. I told you to do that, but it's really not 
up to them. Uh, so he makes a, a phone call. Um, I go back to work you know, a couple of days later. They're like, well, you got what you want. Um, I hope you're happy. We'll, we'll see you in a couple months when you don't make it, which was one of the best things they could have done for me because I absolutely trained my ass off. Uh, I couldn't stand them anymore. I, I did, uh, you know, I had too much pride to get to fight that hard and then, you know, have to swallow it and come back and, and tell them I wasn't good enough. I go to selection a few months later. Uh, I, I come, I come back. Uh, I think I had to turn in some gear that I still had from them. And for whatever reason, I was kind of hoping that, uh, they'd be like, Hey, we were wrong about you. Good job. You're like the only guy that's ever, that's ever made it. Uh, instead they were like, well, guess what? You haven't made it yet. You know, half the guys don't make the Q course, so you'll be right back. And uh, that was the last time I saw him. And I'll tell you how petty I can be. When I retired 20 years later after the Delta Force, a part of me wanted to drive down there <laughs> and and shove my 214 in their face and say, see, see, see what I did? Uh, but of course, I think everyone there would have been. Yeah, they, they're they like, who are you? I would have known who I yeah. was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's how that's how I got to uh that's how I got to 20th group. Um I was uh unfortunate uh, I was unfortunate enough to be smart, um, <laughs> which means I got to be an 18 echo. Um I put after selection, I put down the four MOSs I, I wanted. I put Bravo, Charlie, Echo, Delta. Um, I sure as heck didn't want to be a Delta. Uh, they said, "Congratulations, you got you you got you got your top three, Is, is what the guy right. told me. And I was like, oh, "What's that mean?" He goes, uh, "You're an Echo. It was in your top three. It was only four choices. <laughs> it was it was second to last, is what is what I viewed it as." Um, there's two reasons I wasn't real happy about getting a neck being an echo is because at the time they had a longer uh, Q course than Bravo and Charlie. Uh, and so at, at that time in, in, in 2002, everybody thinks the wars are going to go away if you don't hurry up and get over there. So I wanted a short MOS, Bravo or Charlie. You know, I wanted to try to clip out of Spanish and, you know, and, and be in Afghanistan and, you know, eight, nine, ten months. I mean, the Q course is already long enough with without without the the rest of that um again my what i wanted never seems to, to work out and i always have to just deal with what i got so i got echo um i stayed there longer uh i i tried i tried to test out of spanish i i missed it by like two questions um and uh of course the you know the jokes on me i i didn't get to miss maybe i missed the deployment so instead of 13 maybe maybe i'd have, I'd have had 14 if uh if i got out of there a little quicker um but yeah there's there's a there was a lot of war left and and really i, I look back at that generation of of q course guys and they were good dudes man i'm telling you i i couldn't be i still talk to some of those guys in the q course to this day uh, they were such good dudes, uh, and they went on to do amazing things. And really, little did we know that era of Q Corps students was really going to see mm. fifteen years of war after mm -hmm. that, which which really may be the, the the most amount of combat you know any other generation was was going to see. And we we had we we had no idea what what what, uh, what we were in for. Uh, Brent, real uh, quick, uh, sorry, yeah. real quick, we just need to uh, shout out to our to our two other sponsors for tonight. Um, a, so uh, VPN, everybody should have VPN. Our sponsor tonight is private internet access or PIA VPN. Um, you should use a VPN uh, and PIA VPN has apps that you can put on your computer, on your phone, on your smart TV. It's good security for you. Plus, if you like to stream um, Spotify, if you like to stream Netflix, it, you know, a lot of different times, a lot of these streaming services have content based on the country. So even American movies that may not be available in the U.S. Uh, might be available in Korea or Japan at the time. So you can change the settings on your VPN to give you a completely different, uh, a completely different country starting point. Um, plus, it protects you when you're in public places, when you're in cafes, when you're in airports, when you're in all these different places. 
Um, having a VPN will protect you from man in the middle ta uh, attacks and, and different types of things. You don't have to be doing anything nefarious to want to protect your privacy uh, and your security. Um, so if you want to enjoy all the benefits of private internet access, now's the time to subscribe. Head to piavpn.com slash teamhouse and get eight, an 83% discount. Seriously, 83%. That's just two dollars and three cents a month, and you also get four extra months completely for free. But you must go to piavpn.com/slash/teamhouse for a truly private digital life. One last time, pia. That's Papa India Alpha VPN Victor Papa November dot com slash teamhouse. And the other sponsor for tonight's show is HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. When it comes to options, honestly, more is more. And that's why HelloFresh's menu includes 40 recipes and over 100 add-on items you ch can choose from each week. A busy fall schedule doesn't always leave you with time to spare, and with HelloFresh, you don't need to spend all evening in the kitchen and whip up a wholesome meal. With their quick and easy recipes and 15-minute meals, you get a tasty dinner on the table in less time than it takes to get takeout or delivery. And we have used HelloFresh here in the studio, the three of us, and we've all really enjoyed it. I um, sent us a new batch, and uh, I ate them. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, D. It, it was delicious. <laughs> D's a blue falcon. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Team House and use the code 50 Team House for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Team House and use code 50 Team House for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. So please go and check out Hello Fresh. They are America's number one meal kit. Thank you, guys. Brent, I, I want to ask you a little bit about how 19th and 20th group are structured because we know that the different SF groups uh, generally have, you know, uh, are assigned an area and, and aligned to a particular area. How, like, how did they choose your language? How are 19th and 20th group, the, the guard units, aligned? Yeah. At, at, at the time, uh, a, bat a battalion aligned with the group. So 3rd Battalion, 20th Group aligned with 7th uh, Special Forces Group. So I, I got Spanish because our, our battalion was aligned with 7th. Okay. That's, yeah. Um, the, well, which which really kind of gets me into to, to my days with with 20th Special Forces Group as a Green Beret. Um, I, I was, uh, I spent my whole guard time as a, you know, as a, as a single guy just being a guard bum. I just went from set of orders from school to school to deployment to deployment uh, and just stayed active the, the whole time. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, as soon as I graduated the Q course, I was on a C-130 down to down to Bolivia for uh, for, for a month. Um, I I had only I'd only got to see you know, the, the different ODAs in the company a few times. And I saw these uh, I saw these guys on the dive team who were just who were just better than everyone else and, and were more than happy to prove it. And um, I my senior echo on my first ODA was going was going to dive school because he wanted to go to the to the dive team. And uh, and by by the second or third time, you know, we, we had done some training together. He looked at me and goes, Hey, you should go to dive school too. Um, and so I was like, I'd love to go to dive school. He goes, yeah, it's, it's easy. Just, you know, raise your hand. There's always slots, go to dive school. So I'm getting ready to go down to South America. And j just like he said, you know, all you had to do was say you want to go to dive school and they'll put you in a slot. So I go down to South America. Uh, I start training for dive school before South America. Um, as soon as I get to South America, um, I get an email uh, back, back to AKO again. I get an a AKO email saying that uh, funding fell through and don't worry about don't worry about dive school. And so I said, okay. So for the next three weeks, um, I I went on a very different uh, training uh, regime 
and uh, partied my ass off <laughs> and had a great time. Uh, we, you know, we trained hard, we partied hard. It was a great first, um, first experience. In fact, that team I went down there with had, you know, their, their Bravo on their team. I, you know, uh, went to the unit before me, their 18 Delta on the team, uh, went to the unit as a, as a medic before me. It was a, it was a stacked team, um, of, of great dudes. Uh, that were seasoned guys, you know, they, they'd all, they'd all been to Afghanistan already and multiple trips and they'd all been on the team for like five, six, seven years. So it was a great, great first trip learning. I was the only echo on the team. So, uh, you know, it was a great experience as a new guy to have all the combo to, to fall on me. It was a real cool experience going to hotels and setting up a, you know, SATCOM, you know, PSC five and, you know, shooting out, uh, reports, you know, from a hotel room uh, in different cities and in, in Bolivia, just kind of a in civilian clothes as as you're traveling around. So just a just you know definitely a cool experience in, in that part. Um, it's a couple days before dive school is supposed to start, and I'm at a roadside cafe in Bolivia, and I get an email. Uh, it's an ATARS notification saying uh, giving me you know details of checking into dive school. Um, so I went to the, I went to the warrant officer on the team and, uh, I said, Hey, this is probably nothing, but I, I, I did get this ATARS notification and he's like, well, if you have an ATAR slot, you're, you're going, like you need to get on a plane right now and go to Key West. Um, I, I was both excited to hear that. And also, uh, you know, it, it like a getting punched in the gut going, I, I'm not ready for this. Uh, <laughs> let's hope by, you know, yeah, you know, you know, but there's a lot of things you can do when you're 24 that, uh, that you can't do later on in life. So I, uh, you know, not, not to make these stories long, but you know, just kind of, you know, I, I get in a, a, uh, a, a one way rental car and we drive like me and one other guy that was going to go back with me drive like nine hours straight and there's these massive unrest going on because of the uh, the elections just happened and no one's happy with the 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 election and there's roadblocks everywhere we don't our spanish actually wasn't too bad but it it wasn't enough to be by ourselves negotiating roadblocks <laughs> um we just randomly gave people money that <laughs> You know, I just kept on giving them money until they seemed to be less angry with us and, and they let us go. We get to the airport and uh, we landed on a military base dirt runway in the middle of the night, unloaded and left. So I didn't get my passport stamped. When I get to the uh, when I get to the airport, we're trying to load up and the guy's like, hey, something's weird you don't have a stamp on your passport how, how'd you get in the country and i remember the last thing my warrant officer told me uh was hey if you, if you get in any trouble you know here's here's the here's the here's the number to the embassy call this guy he he's our fixer and so uh i didn't give him an answer about how we got in here i just said hey uh you should probably call this guy first and the guy told me goes i don't care who that guy is how did you get in our country? And you can go ahead and and uh, start looking at other flights because you're not getting on this one. And I was like, you know, okay, that that sucks, but you know, call this guy. He walks away. Thirty seconds later, he looks at me with disgust. He just takes my passport and he stamps it and he says, "Get out of here." To this day, I don't know who that guy was. I don't know what he told him, uh, but you know, just that it was at the end of the, it was a very cool non-combat first experience of, of of being a Green Beret and just you know doing things that really is really unique to uh, to Green Berets. Um, I end up I, I get a I, I fly right to Miami um, and check into die school and proceed to have. The worst six weeks of my life. Um, pull the week was absolutely horrible. Like, you know, I, I quit doing breath holds. I was not ready for it. Um, I was I got dragged out of the pool, you know, almost every day and, and, and asked why why I suck so much. Um, and I just and I remember calling my dad at one point and saying, 
uh, hey, Dad, you know, you know, the Q course has been a lot. You know, just went on a trip down south. Now I'm in, now I'm in dive school. Um, it's just, it's really tough right now. Uh, I think I think I just need to come home for a little bit. And and but my dad is not the the uh, the guy to to cry on his shoulder. Uh, he's he's just a very hard man. But uh, but I also never complain to my dad about anything. Uh, so I think my dad knew if I was calling him to tell him things are pretty tough right now. He just said, "Do what you got to do, son." And I said, "Okay, I'll 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 call you tomorrow, and and let you know." And uh, every day I showed up to the pool and had to fake motivation, like I wanted to be there when it was everything I didn't want to do. And uh, I never called my dad back and told him that I wasn't coming or was coming. My dad said he he figured that when I didn't call back, you know, he he knew and. Again, my dad's just a, a hardcore guy, so it's not like he's going to call me and, and ask what's wrong. That was just the the odd random conversation we had. Um, it was a fleeting moment of weakness. Um, I, I'll come back to that story here in a little bit because I, I tell on myself later in my career saying, hey, this is the hardest thing uh, I've ever done. And I'll I'll tell you the one particular like time. It was like the end of pool week. And you're just, you know, you're just physically exhausted. Um, and uh, they they put us in. And again, and part of was why it was so hard is because I I wasn't ready for it. So, I mean, I'm not saying it would have been easy otherwise, but it, I definitely didn't help myself out. They put us in the pool and they're going to have us do these um, uh, sprints. And they said, hey, and they told us, hey, bring, bring two shirts to the pool this day. Um, and so at the very end of the day, they uh they said hey get get one shirt wet take your take your brown shirt off put them in both your hands and that's what you're going to swim in to get to the other side of the pool these two soggy shirts and uh they said pays to be a winner first one to the other side of the pool gets to get out and um and so everyone you know swam as hard as they could to get to the other side of the pool and uh they didn't let anyone out of the pool they're like hey but that's not this round <laughs> um, they send us back and forth, back and forth, like 15 times. No one gets out of the pool. Um, and it sounds dramatic, but it's just true. Like guys are getting fished out of the pool because, yeah, they're, they're, they're cramping up um, and they're giving it their all. And they're just, and I remember thinking, you know, looking to the guy beside me on the gunnel and, and we didn't say it, but we both, you know, looked at each other and just, you know, said, this sucks. Um, yeah. That, that, that look at another, that empty look in another guy's eyes when he's when he's just giving it his Done. all. Yeah, and yeah, we've all we've all been there. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, I got one more in me, and if uh, if they don't get us out of the pool, I'm I'm quitting because I'll end up at the bottom of this pool if they send me again. So they send us again. I get to the other side of the pool, and I'm talking. I'm I'm coaxing myself up you know well this is it's time it's it's time to quit it's time to quit and me and that guy look at each other one more time and uh we both kind of shake our heads like this sucks and um and he goes f it i quit and gets out of the pool and i remember looking at him getting out of the pool and thinking you quitter i can't believe <laughs> what is wrong with you Know that I was just as big as I. If he would have beat me to it, I probably, I, I probably would have quit. And uh, and just, but I do remember watching him quit. Just disgusted me. And uh, <laughs> I stayed in the pool. We went back and forth or six or seven times. Oh, but I, I guess maybe he he left me some of his energy on on uh, on the way out. Uh, super glad I got die school out uh, out of the way early in my career. Uh, um, like insert joke here, but like, like most divers, uh, I'm a, I'm a proud diver and really, uh, really proud of that accomplishment. Um, the, and it, and it got me to work on the best ODA I, I ever worked with the best group of guys. Uh, honestly, I ended up having one of my best deployments in my military was a 20th group deployment with that dive team running the commandos out of Afghanistan. We just, you know, just when a group of, of really good friends deploy together, have the same mindset uh, and just wanted to get after it um, to, to this day, one, one of my, one of my, one of my best experiences in the military 
and yeah, and dive school is what kind of afforded me that uh, that possibility. I, you know, it's interesting because I, I want to paint sort of a picture for people who may not understand. Earlier, when you're talking about going to dive school or you know the, the chance to go to combat diver school, you know, you said you, the the senior echo said there are always billets available. There are always slots open. And, and the reason for that is because Combat Diver is such a notoriously hard school that people don't sign up for it in general. Like, it is it's one of those schools that somebody has to generally be really motivated to go to because it is such, like, a dick driver. Uh, I don't know if I'd have gone back. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I mean, I... Thankfully, I didn't have to make that decision. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that uh, with a little bit of rest and, you know, I'd have, I'd have, I'd have got back on there. Um, I was really lucky in, uh, in my career to, uh, to, to have not have recycled. Uh, to not, uh, We'll get to it a little bit. There's one thing I recycled, but, it, but SF didn't, didn't hand that to me. Um, and, and dive school with it. I'm not saying the Q course was easy. By no means was the Q course easy. You know, the Q course had really tough days in it uh but just for just an absolute smoke session day in day out you know running red line the whole time die school without a doubt was the hardest military school i went to yeah so talk to us about that that deployment that it led you into with the kandak commandos oh yeah so we um i had uh I had, I'd been selected, uh, for, for the unit. Um, actually, uh, I, I, I got selected and I, I told him to, Hey, we're on the verge of a, of another deployment. And I, and I want to go back to this, uh, um, well, I should say my second time at selection, I get selected and, and we're going, uh, I want to do this, this deployment with, 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 with our guys. It's one last hurrah, if you will. And I told him that. And and they and they were like, absolutely, you just not going anywhere. Go, you know, go 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 fight with your guys. I think they, they respected that. Um, so I go to so that was really cool in, in a weird way, kind of being a, a made man and and twentieth group as a, a guy already selected to go to the unit. Um, and uh, it it was such a great mission. Um, so we didn't have any air assets dedicated to us, you know, we didn't, but we got a lot of aviation assets given to us by the battle space owner. And how those deals usually worked was of course, we're, you know, you know, we're, uh, we had plenty of direct action targets that we collected the Intel for. And we, you know, we, uh, here's a, here's a blast from the past. If you remember terms like JPEL targets, mm -hmm. um, so we had our our list of JPELs to go after, but most of them required to to do it properly. You know, aviation assets. Um, and the battle space owner was interested in giving us aviation assets, but the the battle space owner was actually a a really a really good dude, um, and uh, he also wanted to work out of us, and smartly so. Um, he would give us assets if we would do missions for him. And what he wanted from us was to take our commandos and do valley clearing operations for for his conventional forces, which really was which is a great opportunity, you know, really for us too. Like, and and he's absolutely right. Like, that's the commandos should have been at the very forward edge of those valley clearing operations, you know, taking bullets that so Americans don't have to. It's 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 their country. They're a motivated unit. They were more than happy to do it. Um, they had a short shelf life. So if it wasn't, you know, if I can't remember the exact hours, it's 48 or 72. And uh, trust me, they, they knew what the, the shelf life was. It's even, it's in their charter. And I want to say it's 72. So if, you know, if 72 hours is about to come up, they'll let you know, hey, we're, our, our work's done here. This is, this is, as, this is as much as we're allowed to suck. And, and, and on more than one occasion, for a unit that can't logistically do anything on their own, if they're on an operation, a valley clearing operation, then longer than 72 hours, they'll, they will find taxis to come pick them up in the <laughs> middle of the woods. All of a sudden, they're logistical masters and can find their way back to base. <laughs> but they can't find their way to a mission to save their life. 
Um, that's even, I know I just said they were they, they and they were a great partner for us, but that's that was a uh, that was a reality of them. I'm telling you, I feel like uh, you know the, the more experience I got in SF, the more Robin Sage was real. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember being at Robin Sage going. I have to show up and beg these, you know, these fake G's to let me in their camp and to, to, and to fight with me. Like we're in the real world, we're Americans with, with, you know, with bombers and suitcases full of money. No one's, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to beg anyone to come fight with us. Uh, and there I am in Afghanistan begging our commandos not to leave us going. I, am I in Robin Sage right now? This is, this is crazy. Um, but sure enough, happened on more than one occasion. Um, but those valley clearing operations were great. Uh, they they did suck. I mean, everyone prefers to to get on a helicopter, hit a target in the middle of the night, and not miss a meal or a workout. Um, they they could be trying, you know, even even those are, you know, even and they're still considered short duration missions at three and four days. Um, I'm I'm sure there's some conventional guy listening to me whining about being out for three or four days. Um, but they, uh, you know. When it was cold, it was freezing cold. When it was hot, it was miserably hot. And uh, they would reserve the commando unit to go down the worst parts of the valley. Again, rightfully so. And that's exactly where we wanted to be. But, you know, we did those valley uh, clearing operations. You know, if they teed it up for us and they teed it up for us right, then, then they put us right in the, in the, in the, thick, of, uh, in the thick of things. And we got to do a lot of good work. Um, that... There's there's a couple of really cool stories that that actually come from that particular uh, mission, uh, that deployment. Uh, we were the and I don't I don't know who keeps track of these stats. I remember them telling me, but you know, uh, adding up our you know our, the, the the various kills you get as an ODA, they and they you know they uh, they give you your cast you know kills and your small arms kills, and you know we were up in the you know high couple hundreds. And, uh, and they said that we, uh, we were the, you know, the, the leading ODA in country uh, in kills, which really wouldn't have been hard. It's not, and although we were a really good ODA, it's not because we were amazing. We, we thought we were, um, but they put us, they put us in a good area with the commandos. So we, we, we operated in, in all of the East N2KL. Um, I used to be able to tell you what N2KL stood for. I could probably get most of the, uh, most of the acronyms. Um and it was just a hot spot at that time. So we we had the we had the the, the right partner for us in, in the hottest uh, area of the country. Um, one mission was a uh, a fair you know, not it, it was a great mission. But it's not necessarily the the one you want to get woken up for. Mm. Yeah, I told you that battalion commander was was a great dude. Um, he calls our our team leader and our team sergeant into the office. He's like, hey, um, I need you guys. And uh, and I guess he's, you know, he's 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 teared up, you know, asking for this help. You know, my my team sergeant's like, uh, my team sergeant uh, Rick Spear. He goes, what do you need? You know, he's always given us aircraft. He's always been real real good to us. He goes, what what you know what, what's wrong, boss? He goes, uh, my 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 boys are hemmed up. My boys are hemmed up in a bad way. You know, we got uh, you know we got double digits dead and and double digits uh, wounded. Uh, and those numbers are climbing if we don't if we don't get someone there like right now. And uh, came back, got the ODA, said, "Hey, the you know blades are spinning. We we got to get there." Um, we, uh, if I remember right, this is called Operation Bulldog Bite. Um, we were going to insert to the south of their location because they were still in a, in a firefight, so they didn't want us to to insert there. We we're going to insert south of their location. And the rangers were coming in we're going to insert to the north and we were going to and we were basically it was really going to it, we were supposed to meet them there together but everyone everyone knew it was going to be a race to to try to get to them first and 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 uh and help those guys out well when we inserted the ranger uh 47 had mechanical failures and they and they didn't insert so it was it, it was just us um when we got there we got there Right as uh, first light um, was there, uh, the A's, we we got there a little bit later. We we're supposed to insert in darkness. It was just first light. AC one hundred and thirty got there early to try to uh, uh, make sure that everything was going to be kosher for us. And 
as soon as AC-130 got on station, it started lighting off, and it didn't stop shooting. It, it was shooting while we landed, and when the and when the and and daylight when the 47s took off, it was still firing. Um, and and I remember looking at uh, one of our guys, I'm like, "Isn't that weird?" He's like, well, "What's that?" He's like, "I've never seen an AC-130 in the daylight." He's like, "Yeah, that is that is kind of weird." Um, come to find out. Uh, and heck, one of you guys may know, but it had to go up to like two or three star level approval to keep to keep Spectre flying uh, daylight that low. Um, yeah, agent targets. I, I do, was do, gonna, do you remember? What I, I I was going to say that almost almost always uh, AC uh, Spectre would be like denied daylight ops because it flies so low you can see it, right, and right. they were worried yeah. that it would present a target for man portables and stuff. But to have a, a AC-130 during the day is exceptionally rare. And like and like you said, probably had to be elevated because the, the in-country commanders, like the Air Force, they, they did not allow that at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, it was a weird sight seeing it. You know, uh, yeah, you, know you, you get to hear it a lot. You know what's up there, you know, mm -hmm. on, you know, on multiple, multiple nighttime operations. But when you actually see it during the day, it just it just stuck out. I'm like, man, that's really weird. Um, and and we confirmed, you know, obviously that you know it got told to us that they had to get special approval to to stay on station. And it took us. And of course, we get we get uh, inserted a, uh, a little bit um, a little bit further than we wanted to be inserted. And so it's going to take even longer. So it's going to take all day for us to get up there. Um, we get into, you know, we, there's a couple villages between uh, us and, and them. We get into a little bit of contact, um, but the right call was made. Like, you know, this, you know, engaging it, killing the enemy right now isn't really our, our mission. Our mission is to, to get to these guys as fast as we can. And um, again, I'm, I'm the, I'm, I'm the only combo guy uh, on, on this mission. I was the only combo guy for the, for the most part during that deployment. Uh, and as we're traveling at night, we know we should be getting close to these guys. Uh, and it goes back to, again, I feel like I'm in the Q course. Like at the times you feel like the Q course is so basic and things they tell you in the Q course, they do, they, they come back um, to, to, to ring true in operations. And I remember an SUT being said, uh, being told that the most, and, you, and let me know if, if you remember this, you know, especially in small unit tactics, what is the most dangerous part of, of any mission when, when you leave, when you leave and come back from the wire, you want to take a guess at it? I mean, oftentimes it's right as you clear the objective, right? Cause everyone's tired and you're chilling on security. What the seven dash the seven dash eight answer for that will be re-entry of friendly lines. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're yeah you're re -entry waking up with friendly forces. Yeah, that's right. Re-entry of, of friendly lines, and uh, I always thought that was, uh, you know, uh, a little bit uh, a little bit over the top. Like, I mean, like, don't you think most dangerous thing is you know getting out here and you know and and get it on an ambush line and mixing it up with the enemy. Um, but here I am at 2 a.m. in Afghanistan, and there is this, you know, there's these young 11 Bravos that, you know, that are burying their brothers and watching their other brothers maybe, you know, slowly bleed out. And there's these guys trumping through the woods, trying to link up with them, and I cannot raise them on the radio. Mm -hmm. And and I was walking point at the time, too, going well, this is about fitting. You know, it's my it's my fault, I guess, why we can't make combo. So I guess I should be eating these rounds. Um, I I did everything that I was supposed to do before leaving. You know, I did. You know, I I you know I got their fills. I got their frequencies. I uh, I did radio checks for their guys from the ground. Why I couldn't make combo at that time is is just is the is the bane of every echo's existence. Yeah. Um, and you know when when you needed combo the most, I couldn't make combo, and I just remember walking with my butthole puckered, going <laughs> yeah. every step. I'm afraid these you know these these bushes are going to light up. Um, we never made combo. We never made uh, uh, radio contact with them, and luckily for me, uh, they you know they they 
they they heard things in the bushes. We lit up them like you know they they yelled from a distance. Hey, who is there? We got we got to um, you know speak English, and they they knew it was us. Wow. Uh, and they knew that there was an American force uh, coming, you know, to link up with them. And luckily, that got disseminated all the way to to the outskirts. Um, but I'll I'll never forget how you know um, just how how dangerous uh, that something that that really seems like the least amount of dangerous thing that you would do. Like, you know, there was really, there's no enemy at the time. I, I have, there's so much other dangerous stuff I've done in my, in my military career. Yet that to me, when I tell that story, I can still feel the, yeah. you know, the hair stick up on the back of my neck, yeah. walking through those woods, you know, wait, waiting to get lit up. With a, with a VS 17 well, panel. Like, yeah. Well, it, but, it's night, <laughs> but it's nighttime, right? So yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I, it's yeah. It's nighttime. I have nods. I, you know, I, I don't even know. You know, if they got nods or if you know if, if all their guys you know have nods or if they're still rocking seven deltas on a low loom night. You right, know, which makes them almost just as dangerous with them as as without them. Right. Um. I'll 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 tell you this this war story real quick. How they even how they how they I'll rewind it and tell you how they got into this position and what'll blow your mind. What we talked about after we met up with them. So it's really a sad story about uh, about the bureaucracy of our military and the inability for people to make decisions. This was one of their very last um, valley clearing operations. It's it, it had been a very quiet deployment for those guys, and they just hadn't seen a lot of action. So they you know they. They started, yeah, in my mind, a little bit to, to lose respect for the battlefield. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I mean, people don't understand, you know, that there's a lot of lull to war. And yes, we lost a lot of guys in Afghanistan, but there's plenty of guys who went and deployed and never fired their gun and they never saw anything bad. And they just, they woke up every day, went to bed every day and eventually went home. And it's not a sexy story to tell your friends, but that's the truth for really a, a lot of soldiers in Afghanistan. Um, these guys hadn't seen much, much combat at all. Uh, they come across this, uh, this house and this house is completely full of IEDs, full of IEDs. And so the company commander says, Hey, um, we're not going to touch this stuff. There's way too much. None of it. I don't feel we're, that we're competent enough to, to move this stuff where we should anyway. I'm just going to call a strike on this house. So they get into a long haul and they start the process of trying to get someone to authorize dropping on this house. No one wants to make the call. The, you know, the battalion commander doesn't want to make the call. The brigade commander. And in fact, it's probably worse than that. Not to drag out the story, but the, you know, the OPSO didn't want to make the call, who eventually made it to the EXO and eventually made it to the battalion commander. Like all these thresholds and levels and everyone just passing the buck up, passing the buck up, passing the buck up. Well, they had been here for like four hours mm -hmm. just waiting for someone to give them any sort of guidance of what of what they should do. Well, it's human nature. I'd probably do it. Two, but what does Joe do after four hours of being in the hot sun yeah. after not seeing any act? Joe does what Joe does. Yeah. And uh and I say that like I said, I I'm not a robot. I I I do the same things. Um We're all it Joe. allowed me right. yeah. to get up within very close proximities and and lob a volley of RPGs and 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 uh and machine gun fire and just absolutely lay waste to these guys. And they really didn't have a, a, a solid fighting chance at it. Um, they, they overwhelmed them pretty quick and hurt them pretty bad. Uh, and, you know, and that's when we got the call. So the fact that at the end of the day, it was just indecision on anyone wanting. And of course, as you can, uh, it's collateral damage is the reason they don't want to um, destroy a building. Yeah, destroy yeah, destroy that building or and uh, there was another building close, like you know, fairly close to it, so they were concerned about that building. Rather than being concerned for the safety and well being of our soldiers, they cared more about mud buildings and we sent right. guys home in body bags for it. Mm -hmm. It'll always be wrong. Um and that's how so that's that's how we got there. 
now I'll get now we'll fast forward. We're here. We're talking to these guys. Um, the uh, we're gonna go. Uh, you know, we're gonna go up and and get a little bit of shut eye because we're they're gonna go come pick them up in daylight the next day, and so we tell them. And of course, they're still in the they're in the valley. Like this house is is in the valley. Um, they're still in this house or in this compound. And we said, "Hey, we're going to go up to that high ground over there and and get the tactical advantage." And I suggest you guys come with us. And uh, and even then, they're like, "No, like you guys got it up there. Like you guys can protect us from up there, right?" And I'm like. Kind of like, I'm like, yeah, what would be, what would be a better bet would just to be up there with us. Like right. that's, that's where you want to be, not, not down here in this Valley, but, um, but yeah, you know, I'm not going to be too hard on them. You know, I mean, obviously they're, they, they were dealing with a lot beat down pretty hard. Um, and, uh, maybe they just needed him. You know, they were more than willing to have someone come save them and help them out. But that's that, that, and I'll, I'll tell you one more after this, but, you know, we'll let you guys ask questions or, or talk about it a little more. Do you, if you remember want to. the that, rank? That doubt was one of our better missions. Uh, sorry. But, but I don't mean that. And you know, guys lost their lives. Yeah. You know, sure. I'm trying to think of a, a good word to use where I say, you know, better missions. It's, like, it's one of the more significant mission, like, actions. And, and you guys went in there and helped out fellow American soldiers. That's that right. Makes it, makes it meaningful. That's right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the feeling it's only happened probably two more times in my career. Um, like, you know, to, to get there and face to face and strangers, just absolute strangers look at you and want to hug you because you, because you showed up and they, yeah. and they, and they, and they, you know, they needed someone with guns to show up and, you know, they, they're just, you know, they, they were sitting there waiting, waiting to die. And, we're, I mean, if they knew us, we were as big as jackasses as, as, as anyone else, you know, like we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're definitely not at times to be put up on a pedestal, but at the end of the day, Hey, when the green berets show up and the guys with beards show up, like you're expected, you know, to, 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 to fill that role. And we were more than happy to fill that role for them. And we we're more than happy to, to protect those guys and get those guys out of there. Uh, out of curiosity, do you remember the size of the, that element that you guys went in to relieve or to, to salvage? Uh, I want to say in, in the in the twenties. And then do you um, do you recall like what the uh, was it was it a captain was it like a a, a, a PL or a second or a I, lieutenant? I know I'd I'd have to Ed, we there's there's. I don't know if a uh, few guys have one like this. I would need a lifeline, and our <laughs> medic Mark DeMeo remembers everything. Yeah, everything. I could call Mark right now. He'd tell you exactly how many guys are there, the rake of that dude, and and the area that we were operating in. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just curious I, uh, if like the the officer, like the 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 ground force commander, was the one making the call not to like evac with you guys up the up the hill, or if. If he was getting it from higher, that no, st like stay in place until we resolve what we're going to do with this these IEDs. Yeah, I just I just remember that being you know the the answer to the to the conversation. Obviously, the the, the team sergeant had that uh, had that conversation with whoever is in charge and yeah, and uh, maybe in the combo guy was probably right next to the commander sit, sitting up sit reps. Yeah, and, and so was there something else with that you wanted to talk about how that operation wound down or? Uh, if it sounded like maybe there was something else you wanted to say about it. Um, no, not about that one. I'll, I'll talk about one more. That's, okay. you know, that's kind yeah. of similar happened the same trip, but I'll tell you one of the weirdest things. Um, uh, one of the weirdest things that ever happened was at the end of that operation. And by the time we actually got helos in there, it was actually, it was actually at nighttime. So we actually stayed, you know, all day during the day, got all the wounded out, um, and whoever could walk to this next LZ, we were all going to walk that uh, to, to that uh, HLZ and get out of there with a under with a 47. So it's nighttime. Uh, we're, we're, we're in PZ posture and our interpreter comes up to me and goes, hey, uh, one of the guys found a goat and um, he he really wants to keep it. Um, and my initial reaction was like. No, you can't. 
bring a goat on a 47. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, I don't know. Was, another part of me was like, you know what? Sure. Yeah, he can have the goat. So I, for whatever reason, authorized this guy to have a goat on the 47. And um, and he's just holding this goat the whole time. He's holding it. And we're, we're on this, um, like, steep ledge. So here on this, the top of this plateau is where it's going to land. And we're at the very edge of, of this really steep ledge. So when the 47 comes in, tailgate this way, um, I look at him and I tell the interpreter, hey, hold on to that goat tight. We're, we're, we're getting ready to go. And, um, and I'm just watching him. Uh, <laughs> I'm just watching with nods. And it looks like he does this and then just throws the goat off, <laughs> off the ledge to, to its little goat death. And I'm like, those, they're so weird. You know, <laughs> Afghans just do weird things, you know? Just shaking my head like, I thought you wanted that goat. Why would you throw that goat off? And so this, this, this question is, is boggling, my, boggling my mind the whole ride over. So as soon as the wheels land down in, in, uh, in Jalalabad and we can get away from the rotor wash, I go grab the interpreter. I'm like, hey, why did he kill? Why did he kill that goat? I thought he wanted that goat, and uh, and he said, and, and apparently he says the uh, the forty seven scared the goat, and the goat lo- <laughs> back legs launched off of his chest, and he tried to grab it, but from my angle, it looked like he threw the he threw the goat off, so the poor goat jumped to its death. But it was the weirdest thing in the world to witness, not not knowing what's going on. And I really feel like that sums up my experience. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you're lucky it was just one goat because that could have started if there had been a, like a flock or a herd of goats out there, or oh. whatever it is, like everybody would have wanted a goat. And you would have had oh, a 47 oh, oh, no. full we, of goat We would have started a horrible, a horrible precedence. Uh, of them based probably stealing goats and taking them on the 47s yeah. with yeah. us. And I'm sure I'm sure that would have been a uh a theater wide email at uh, at some point. Pretty Thanks. soon you're up to donkeys. Yeah, you would you would have been the <laughs> do- the Dr. Doolittle of Afghanistan uh <laughs> shepherding goats around uh, on 47s. Gosh. The uh that that same trip um uh I'm in so I'm in civilian clothes. I'm getting ready to go on the ring route. And I have to go down to Bagram. Uh, I don't even either for Op Fund or, or or for crypto. There, there's some reason I had to go down to Bagram. So I'm in Jalalabad. I'm in Jabad, waiting for the ring flight. And this like uh, this E5 or E6 guy comes up to me and goes, uh, um, and me. There's another guy with me on my team. Can't remember who was who was with me. But he comes up and he goes, "Hey, uh, you guys, special forces." And I mean, I'm wearing civilian clothes. I mean, could have been a contractor, but you know, lucky guess. I'm like, uh, yeah, we're special forces. He, and he's like, hey, I, I, I've been looking for you guys. I've been, I've been trying to call you guys. Been trying to email you guys. I'm really trying to get a hold of you guys. I'm really glad I got to see you. And I'm thinking, what, what email are you using? What, <laughs> what phone number? Like, what, like, how do like this, this whole thing's starting out weird already. And then he gets like, you know, you know, real emotional and he's like, Hey man, I'm we're out at Cop Najil. He goes, It's uh it's you know the next province over, it's a really small base. He goes, We're just waiting to die. He goes, We're there's nothing we can do about it. We're just waiting to die. I you know, I have to sit there and, and tell my guys that they're gonna be okay, you know, help is coming, you know, it's not it's it's not that bad when I know it's that bad. And I'm like, man, that is that was a horrible story. Um, I was like, "Look, get, give give me a give me a red line number, and um, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do." Okay, and he was like, "All right," and so he leaves. I cancel my ring flight trip, and I go back to to the uh, to the team house, you know, and I go to the you know the team leader and the team sergeant. I'm like, "Hey, like, you know, tell them the same story." I was like, uh, "You mind if I look into this?" And uh, they're like, "No, yeah, sounds sounds like something you should look into." And again. That's what's really cool and that I'll always miss about, you know, being on, being a Green Beret 
is you know the 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 autonomy to do whatever you want it's it's a lot of work unfortunately to collect your own intel <laughs> and to you know create your own con ops you know execute your own missions with only 12 guys and a partner force but it's but it's but it's all worth it at times when you get to 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 do things like this and so i call i call the guys up uh i talk to their first sergeant it's a company size element out there company jill as, and uh, without trying to throw that guy on the bus, trying to feel out what's going on. And the first one was like, yeah, it's pretty bad out here. If Can can you guys come out here? And I was like, OK, I I'll, will we'll come out and look. And um, so me and my team sergeant get on a, a Black Hawk and we we fly out there to Cotton Jill to see what's going on. And it's a gosh, I wish I could remember the state. I want to say it's like an Illinois National Guard unit um, out there. And uh, they start telling me everything that's wrong. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, they're they're screwing this up somehow. Like they're, you know, they're 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 being cowards. They're, you know, this is what happens when you're not aggressive towards the enemy. And uh can, you know, I obviously that was like deep in the back of my in my mind. But yeah, you know, I, I thought it. And so I'm listening to these guys' story. And I'm and so I'm like, so that's so you know the you know the point of origin where it's always coming from. And they're like, well, there there's only three points of origin. I said, "All right, we'll s send out an SR team and set up on uh, on all three ports ports of origin. There's there's nine, ten, twelve guys. I know you're a company, but that's that's easily doable. They're like, can't do that. We can't go out, and I'm I'm gonna screw up the number a little bit, but um, we can't go out with less than twelve people on a patrol. He goes, and so with twelve people on a patrol, if I'm to go put three people." So, you know, on, on those points of origin, three teams of those points of origin, that's 36 people right there. That already puts us at, you know, at, at full strength for, for running operations because that means half the guys are sleeping while the other half are out. And as mm -hmm. soon as those guys come back, those guys go, to, go, go out on operations. And the only thing we've done is run 24-hour ops on three different, three different point of origins, and we're not even, you know, we're not even living. We're not doing, like, we're not... Like you can't run operations like right, that. Right, right, right. I'm like, I was like, twelve guys to leave. These points of these, these poos, if you will, are like twelve hundred meters away. Like they're not that far. I'm like you have to twelve guys to go a click outside the wire. And he's like, Ab absolutely. Um, and just they couldn't they couldn't drive. They couldn't drive down to the next village, which was only four or five hundred meters out, outside their gate. Uh, without getting completely riddled and, and, and have to turn back around. Uh, they couldn't get air support. They asked for guys to do valley clearing operations. Uh, and just the more, um, you know, I sat there with those guys, the more uh, the, the first sergeant, again, he was a National Guard infantry first sergeant. He was a good dude. He had, he was, you know, he was just a solid guy. He had a lot of answers and a lot of things he tried. But in the, the day, they just weren't capable of, of solving this problem. And so we uh, we went back and we and we did something that we rarely, rarely do. Um, we put the the uh, oh, I'm going to forget words now, but the Kandak was broken up into three elements. Like Kandak is already a battalion. Um, so whatever I, companies. Yeah, sorry, companies. So they're broken up into three companies and we were going to bring two companies of commandos to, to, to clear this valley. Which is which? Which we've never done because, you know, they're on a red, orange, and green training cycle, so mm -hmm. they're always in third. So to bring two companies forward was was a big deal. The Soda headquarters gave us a bunch of pushback, and they're like, "I don't know what you guys are talking about. We've asked, you know, we've we've put singing birds around there. We've asked our, our humanters. Like, we're not getting anything in in that area. Like, they're asking us to please go do something else." And they were like, no, we've been on the ground. These guys are hurting. Like, this valley needs to be cleared. Um, we we set off on what we called Operation Rockstar. That was back in the day when ODAs could still name their own naming conventions um, before people probably uh, uh, took uh, took yeah. some, some, some free speech liberties with naming their operations. <laughs> Operation <laughs> Penthouse, you know, get approved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had, 
Yeah. And, and I love it. And everyone got behind it. Like all the, uh, the, the aviation support called all the HLZs like Ringo and, and like all and uh, and, and, you know, HLZ Bon Jovi and everything. And it was, um, we inserted that night and the helos, it was, it was a long Valley. Um, and the, the, uh, the cop was at the very base of the Valley. So we were going to insert at the very northern part and then kind of like a hammer and anvil operation. So so the so the base only had to basically be the anvil of it. And we would push them all down, uh, all down the valley um, or at least contain them in the valley. We we get uh, we come into fire as heavy fire as soon as as soon as we as soon as we land. And uh, and we're thinking. And the soda didn't even want us here. right here. Here we are taking massive, you know, uh, RPK fire from PKM fire from the from the mountainsides. And you told us there was no one here, and that it was just a bunch, you know, a couple, uh, basically a couple low level crooks lobbing RPGs in the base every now and again. Um, the our team leader immediately called uh, a called Cass. Um, that's a whole nother story, but I'll touch it on it for just a second. At the time, you had to have battalion level approval to call CAFs. Um, we had a great team leader who knew the rules, and there is a caveat to that. Um, during the infill of an operation, when they know you're vulnerable, you do not have to call battalion for approval, and you could immediately call CAFs from the ground. That's a, that's exactly what he did. And if you wouldn't have done that, we'd have had a bunch of shot up birds that uh, that night. So he does that. Uh, uh, we quell, we quell that, uh, and there's just these pockets as yeah, as we move, pockets and pockets and pockets, and uh, most of them were were really from from the uh, the sides of the, of the mountain, so it wasn't a whole lot of like uh, close, mm -hmm. you know, personal type combat, but the, the type of combat that is it's great and it's great for numbers because really, just by you being in the valley is what stirs them up, you know, oh, on on these on these mountain sides, and then just air support comes in and, and crushes them. Well, the very first one that we called air support on was way up there, and uh, I wasn't on it, but we we asked a, a a couple guys to go up there and do a BDA on uh, on that. And it took them hours to crawl up this mountain to get to that BDA site, but when they did, what we found were guys in ACUs, and they were foreign fighters. Holy shit! And we found them all through the valley. Long story short, by the time we get done with this valley and get home, the guys who didn't want us even going on the mission were giving us all sorts of kudos and praises for <laughs> one of the for one of the you know the the biggest noble operations you know that that we took on, and they didn't even want us to go. Um, our our captain, as soon as we get home, gets home, uh, gets gets um, uh, where do I want to like um temporarily uh fired or we'll see if he's fired because the siege of of commander wanted him on his on on the carpet like now because he heard that he didn't use the right protocol for calling in CAS mm. and, and he called in CAS without a battalion level approval and he sat there in Bagram for like a week and then he sees the siege of of commander tells the story and goes oh I didn't know it was during infill. You're good, and and sends them back to the team. Uh, while fortunately for us, while we're running amok for another solid week with, <laughs> without our team leader, <laughs> actually had, going on, I'm going on some great missions. Um, but but he didn't deserve that. And that and again that 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 deployment was really like one of the the spur you know the moments that truly spurred me to say as. And as great as that deployment was, like, you know, we got to save like those guys when we got back to their camp, they all you know, gave us the biggest hug. And they're like, man, thank you for saving our lives. We don't think we, we were going home without you. Um, like you really feel like you, you, you did something worthwhile. But there was a reoccurring theme that deployment, which was this. Con ops had gotten crazy to 20 and 30 pages. Yeah, it was getting increasingly harder to fight you feel like you're fighting the enemy and the soda and siege of soda trying to get out the door if the enemy could move as long as the enemy moved every night 
then he was moving faster than 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 we could keep up with because that con op that was approved was was for this location. Um, it got it got really disheartening. Well, I mean, what a, they, what, a, what, a what a ridiculous what a what a ridiculous situation that you have soldiers on the ground there who are telling you, hey, we're getting hit every night, but higher is saying, well, we don't have it on SIGINT, so I guess it's not happening. It the the whole thing. At a um, at a battalion and, and higher level, you know, not and not just at, at and within SF and within the military, really just kind of to started to yeah. disgust me, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and if we weren't there with such a solid team of good dudes who were just willing to do whatever it took to get out the wire, uh, they really did have a good attitude. Generally speaking, they're like, okay, fine. You want twenty pages? I'll make you. I'll get if that's what it takes to get out the wire. I'll give you twenty pages. You want thirty pages? Then we'll get really efficient at writing thirty pages, and we'll get out the wire. Um, they were, you know, they were just a really good team when it came to that. That really could have crushed, you know, uh, other teams, and did, and it did. It what, did what, crush. What other year OBAs. was this? Do you remember roughly? Yeah, oh nine. Oh nine. This is about yeah. uh, McChrystal years. Yeah, because I remember talking to. Um, 10 or 10, 2009, 2010. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember talking to uh, an SF soldier sometime in like in the 08 to 09 time frame, And he said that if they were on target and they fired their weapon, there would be a fifth, they had to fill out a 15 six, dash six, like the, the, that it just got so ridiculous for a while. Um, yeah. And, and, I don't I don't mind if the war warrants that if we're making results and we just don't need American cowboys, you know, go, going on target just to spike the football every night. Right. right. I, 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 I get that. You know, and as and as a younger soldier, that's you know, I I would I would have never said that. And I'd be like, as long as we're here, we need to be out on target. Um, yeah, I did get a little bit older and wiser, but we weren't there yet. Yeah. And I think the biggest problem that i saw was ground guys were reporting ground truth mm -hmm. right. i saw it firsthand that those reports we had these like green yellow and red reports about how they're doing planning wise how they're doing logistically how they're how you know uh, how their uh how their training is going and we generally gave him yellows and reds across the board yet when you see a, a polished product later up at a siege of sodas level looking like it's you know like everything's rosy when right. that's not what we said yeah right it's always and and not to disparage military intelligence because because there are a lot of two shops or a lot of human like there's a lot of good work in the intel but there's also a okay. lot of bureaucracy bureaucracy there where when guys like like you were talking about these guys but when guys are on the ground are reporting what's going on and then you have you know two shops, you know, Intel shops going, no, we don't have any intelligence that supports us. Like, well, there's your fucking intelligence. Like, why do you think your product supersedes what these guys on the ground are telling you? Hey, and that's, that's part of unit history right there. Like we, we had, we've, there's been a disconnect for a while. You can go all the way back to, oh, I'll get close, but um operation anaconda in 2003 someone help me out on that but it's got to be close oh, to that yeah. early, er, er, early war where you know these ground units are are saying hey there's a major a collection of enemy uh personnel in this area and and higher ups going nope we sent over as you know I, the isr over there didn't see anything mm -hmm. and I go no they're there and say, nope, we sent ISR over again. There's nothing there. And then it, it, you know, it took, you know, unit AFO troops to go to go up there in twos and threes and live on the side of a mountain for a few days and go, holy crap, this place is crawling with people. And and even then, like them kind of be like, well, we don't really see it on, on ISR. That's one of the reasons Operation Anaconda was such a, a debacle so Brent, over reliant on 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 isr right and not guide the ground we uh we jumped forward a little bit um you had talked about that before this deployment you had also you'd gone to selection beforehand can you talk to us a little bit about um when the idea of going to trying out for the unit came about into your mind and and then like going to selection uh 
No, because I failed selection the first time. I don't talk about my failures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, go, going to selection the uh, the the first time um, goes goes back to the um, you know the adage of I I didn't want to I. I, I I didn't want to be done with my military career. Not that I was thinking of retiring or being done at, at any time real soon at that point. But at, at this point in my career, I felt like, you know, I went into the military, you know, check. I, you know, I became a Green Beret because, you know, you know, being in the regular military was, wasn't enough. And then I was like, Hey, there was a small group of guys within SF that, that, that I thought were even better. And, you know, and, and going to a dive team check, like, you know, I, I can, I continued to to push myself and and you know and 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 make it. Uh, you know, I wanted to go to war real bad. I went to war to war several times, and I felt like I was really good at it. You know, uh, you know, check. Like I'm 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 continuing to get to look for challenges, meet them, and it, and you know, there's a, a a couple things going on. One, I I wanted to see how how far I could go. Um, I didn't think I was the best guy on my team. And that's why, like, you know, I, I needed to go to selection because I got a, because I'm, you can't, you can't soar with, with Eagles when you're hanging around buzzards. Like it was, it was, it was nothing like that. And in fact, I was probably the third best guy on my team. Um, I wasn't even the best guy on my ODA. Uh, and, but I was the only guy that went to selection and I, I, did I never told anyone this, but I did get tired of hearing a lot of people train up for selection and you know going to sniper school, you know, and going to this school and you know, uh, like, um, and always like uh, collecting this 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 perfect packet to go to selection with because they're because they're going to go to CAG, but they they forgot the most important part of the process, which was. It, going to selection um and so it's had a lot of people talk about it but but never do it and um uh so there's a, a lot of and and i i knew even before that deployment handwriting was on the wall deployments are going to go away iraq was already starting to go away at that time you know there were rumors of you know of, of afghanistan combat operations uh beginning to get questioned and, and put into halt and i wasn't done deploying and I knew I could go to one other place and and hopefully, you know, continue to deploy and maybe even deploy the rest of my career. So you kind of take that that whole, you know, that whole mound of evidence. And that's what that's what drove me to go to selection. So took uh, two shots, which is not abnormal at, at all. Right. And in fact, I don't like I like calling the first one a recce. So the first <laughs> one, the first one was a recce. Um, and I made it really far. Like I, I made it. Uh, like the only thing I didn't do was the forty miler, and it was definitely one of those things where you show up, you know. And even though, um, you know, as an ODA, you don't have this. Like, yeah, I never felt this weird. Uh, oh, we're just twentieth group, you know. Like our, our ODAs always thought, you know, had a had had nothing but uh, uh, knew knew they were good, and and if you questioned it, were more than willing to prove it to you. So I never really had this in, in my career. This oh, I'm just twentieth group. Um, until I showed up to, to selection and I don't know, it was just a bunch of really big guys and, uh, you know, guys telling all these crazy stories and like, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I am out of, out of my league a little bit and then just slowly, you know, the, the, the days go by and the days go by and the class gets smaller and smaller and, and, and you're still here and, and all those big loudmouth guys, uh, you know, did, didn't make time standard this day and that day and, and really, by by the end of it, you're it's um, probably a dramatic way to say it, but you kind of know you know how in three hundred, like they get to the the end of it, and they're like, we actually might win this thing. You know, they kind of thought it was a suicide mission, and then they think they they actually could pull it off. Um, it's kind of like how I started the field. Like you know, <laughs> a, actually, I you know I'm looking at everyone around me, and I'm I'm just as good as 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 anyone here. Um, I can I can make this thing, um, and as soon as I about the time I started feeling like that, uh, I got cut, um, and uh, which was the very end of it. And I remember going to the um, I won't talk about, uh, the uh, we'll we'll just I got we'll just say this I got interviewed at 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 the end, and uh, the the interviewer was like, um, 
Uh, you know, I'm just just not gonna no, I'm not gonna talk about it. Did did you the, did, uh, did you get good feedback as in terms of what you could improve if you came back? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I I um, I'll yeah, I'll try. I, I do. I don't mind coming on podcasts. And I don't mind, you know, uh, you know, talk about the unit and so, you know, uh, selection, you know, selection is sacred. Right. Yeah. Um, right. You know, we get it. There's, and there's some things I will talk about. Um, but yeah, I, I was, yeah, I was able to talk some at the end. He did ask me some questions. Um, I'm afraid if I go into it, I, I'll end yeah. up you know, giving someone sure, some sure. answers. But, but they, but, but they did welcome you to come back again, try out again. Yes. He, he, he asked, he asked me how I did. I, I told him I thought I did. Um, I, I thought I did pretty well. And then he, he laughed at me cause he said, well, you're, you're sitting here. You must not have done that well. And I was like, ouch. I was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty much true. We, we had a, uh, we had a lively conversation after that. And, uh, I must've said something right to, uh, to let him have pity on me and, uh, bring me back for a second try. And so, uh, I, I went, went deployed uh came came back came back again and was uh was was just and I, and I truly mean this like i got just lucky enough to 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 get through the process yes i trained for it a lot of guys did you know i was i was in the top third you know uh, of the class whenever we did anything you know i mean i know physically i deserve to be there so you know why do i feel lucky because there are guys that were way ahead of me and, and always ahead of me and and didn't make it um mm -hmm. you know it's just it's a weird mm -hmm. it's it's a weird process that has that has a a weird way of working uh, of working things out um and there's there's a saying that didn't make a whole lot of sense at the beginning and and uh they'd say hey we're not looking for the best guy we're looking for the right guy mm -hmm. and uh i remember thinking to myself wouldn't the best guy be the right guy kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, and again, uh, just the, the longer I was there, the, the truer that, that, uh, that saying, uh, rang out was it's, it's not the best guy. It's the right guy. Mm -hmm. So I was just, again, l lucky enough to be the right guy. So you get picked up and then, uh, off to OTC. And I mean, what, what was that experience like for you? I mean, did you, you enjoy, uh, the, the training? Yeah, I'll I'll tell you. Um, I will tell you this about selection. It'll because it'll it'll roll into sure. into OTC as well. Selection, bar none. I don't care where you've been, what you've done is the most professional thing you will ever witness. And and the, you know, I, I wish I could you know, kind of go into detail and tell you like what you know how professional it is and how it'll blow your mind. Um, but I, I'll just leave it at that. It is. It is the most professional thing you'll you'll ever experience and i don't know if you ever you know you've ever had this experience where you go to a, a military school and things are they're they're run okay but they're a little, a little discombobulated and you know it makes you feel at one point like is this your guy's first time ever running this course uh, yeah I mean, are fine. you just making this up have, as you go along yeah yeah you gotta have this figured out by now that happens zero times ever in west virginia it mm -hmm. is the most professional thing you will ever it's so professional We've had guys quit before because they saw the level of professionalism in a course and just said, I'm not that professional. I <laughs> I can't be this professional and I can't meet this standard and so and select themselves off off the professionalism of it. So um, I'll absolutely say that uh, they you know, the, uh, the the unit and selection that des deserves that uh, that credit um, and to be known for that. And. Uh, OTC um, was still professional. I say not as professionals. You know, they um, it uh, you messing up an, an OTC on a CQB run, and there will be a you know a large muscular man yelling at you from the catwalk. You know, l letting you know how much you suck and how much you probably don't deserve to be here. And uh, you know, it is it is up to you to to, to deal with that information. And, uh, and and react to, react accordingly. Um, the two things that that they gave me uh, were this: I felt challenged, and I I felt like the um, you know the the, the skill set that that I was acquiring and the resources required to you know needed to develop this type of skill set were were finally there. Like 
Um, it just, it's, it's like, it's like being in a tactical Disney world. I mean, just everything's at, at your fingertips. If you need it, you'll get it. Um, it's with, without a doubt, the most amazing place I've ever worked. And, then, uh, and 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 uh, I almost feel bad sometimes telling people like how great I had it because even though special operations and and as a whole generally speaking you know have have money and they have equipment but very few people really know what it's like to never want for anything. <laughs> so what what was it like <laughs> what what was it like when you graduated and showed up to your team and walked into their team room that first day? Um I I knew this. I knew when um, when I graduated OTC, uh, it's one of the few times in life where I feel like I um, I took a moment and, you know and thought to myself, hey, like re remember this. Like this will be this this may be the greatest accomplishment of your life. I know you know maybe maybe that even sounds dramatic, but at least at least I felt aware enough to know that this is something you know few people actually get to do. Uh, at the end of the day, if you don't make select, if you know, even if you make selection, but you don't make OTC, you did something great that still very few people do. But it's not you don't feel good, you know, about right. not making it. Um, uh, and I and I, but I knew at that point, even if they fire me in six months, I was an operator, and I you know, and I <laughs> did you know, you did uh, it, yeah, you know, at, I, I did this. I accomplished this. I was good enough. I, you know, and am one of the very, uh, I'm in a part of one of the smallest brotherhoods and in, in all of the military. And I definitely, I, I, re, uh, I, I enjoyed that moment. Um, and then of course, when, when the realization of, you know, getting into your team room and that what you thought was, was pretty good CQB, um, the, uh, my, my first team leader did, who did not, um, hand out compliments uh, ever to anyone. Um, kind of let it slip that I graduated number one in CQB, which I knew I I, I knew I was doing pretty good at then at then CQB. But he was letting me know. He goes, uh, so you think you think you're good just because you graduated number one in CQB? What's well, it's not going to be fast enough here. And uh, and I looked at him. I go, so I graduated number one in CQB, huh? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember going like, "No, that's that's not what this is about. But, but forget that. But that's 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 not a compliment. It's, it's nothing." And we go on. And we go on. Oh, I heard it. Oh, I heard you. Yeah, I want to see you be. Uh, no and, big deal. But he was abs. But yeah, but uh, he was absolutely right, man. You you get over there and those and and they and they'll tell you this is usually a pretty similar experience. They'll go to the the shoe house for the first the first couple you know the first couple days and at least the first day the first couple runs they'll tell you hey just hang out in the back and don't try to shoot anything and that's and and uh, and those and I'll always remember those first few runs going who yeah that's that's gonna be tough to keep up with you know uh, I, I I didn't feel like I didn't belong but I knew that uh, I was about to get challenged again and it and it was just it was just another good feeling knowing that because it happens sometimes in our careers in special operations where you make it to something and you're like, no, it's good. And it's, I mean, it's really good, but it's not exactly everything I thought it was going to be. You know, you, you have those moments. Um, and you know that the, the unit just never really gave me that moment. Right. I was, yeah, it, it is what you think it is. It must be like on one hand as a new guy, a little intimidating, but at the same time, you're like, I'm with like the absolute top notch guys. So, I mean, it must be awesome to be around that kind of talent. It, um, that particular team leader loved, you know, you know, loved his team to, um, to have a lot of confidence, but, but to, to back it up as well. Um, and uh, I remember, our, you know, my first deployment going over there with those guys, you know, still think me, yeah, I you know, have more than enough experience under, under, underneath my belt of combat experience, but there's always this, um, um, like when you're on the white side, like, again, it's, it's kind of like national guard and 20th group. Like you don't, like you know, guys that went there, but like once they go over there, you, they go into a black hole and you never talk to them again. 
Like you have, you hear rumors of what goes on over there, but no one really knows. You hear that they're, you know, you hear that their target sets are, are so much livelier. And, you know, when they go on target, you know, it's always, it's always a, it's always a lively night. And you just hear these, these stories. And so, um, you know, I was a little bit, you know, didn't know what to think of the unknown, you know, on, on my first deployment. But I do remember, you know, being next to those guys and after, you know, running through the shoot house with them and, um, you know, watching them in mission planning and decision making and, and just how they carried themselves day in and day out and how well they knew their job. Um, like, I, I remember getting on a helicopter going, I'm good. Like, I, I'm with these guys. Um, you know, I'm, I'm good. And and feeling still feeling like I can contribute with these guys. But still knowing <laughs> these guys, these these guys are going to take us home, <laughs> and that's what they did. And man, that's what they did. And those 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 guys w- were exactly who I thought they were. Uh, as soon as we got into combat, they were great. Just can't say enough good things about them. And and so at this point, I mean, you're you're off to the races. You did another another eight deployments to the Middle East. Um, and I mean, what what what? Uh, I mean. I don't know what, what you're comfortable talking about. I mean, are there any particular operations that stand out in your mind or any particular experiences that you think are uh, significant either to you personally or, or maybe to the history of, of special um, operations, frankly? I, I could have done without getting shot. Um, <laughs> I get I, it. <laughs> stands out. I, I, was, I was running pretty clean there for, uh, you know, probably going into almost double digit deployments and, uh, you know, everyone on my team had a purple heart. And, uh, but then I, I do remember, uh, um, I'll, you know, I'll say this about the night I get, I got shot. I, I was, I was getting more, um, more aggressive and more aggressive, you know, and things that, that I, I probably, I, I knew they weren't like flagrant, but I knew that I probably shouldn't have been doing business that way and that there was probably a smarter way to do business. But, you know, it's not like I just, you know, turned into like an aggressive retard. Like I just, I'd slowly continue to go down this, you know, this, this path and got away with it Mm. and then got away with Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. you know, and even, you know, a couple of times, like, you know, got to kill, you know, some people that I, that I wouldn't have been in a good position to kill otherwise. And so it, you know, kind of reinforces that, Hey, you know, just the most aggressive guy, the fastest guy wins and always wins. And that's just how it is. Um, and that is true, ninety nine percent of the times. And you 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 play like that long enough, you you will roll snake eyes. Uh, yeah. And 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 I rolled snake eyes uh, one night, way too close, way too far. You know, on squatter patrol, squatter control. You know, a click away out from the rest of the assault element, continuing to engage a guy, engage guys, and get drawn further and further out. And even knowing that and being like, hey, we're, you know, there's, you know, we just got away with that last one. And there's, there's more people, you know, behind, you know, in this next group, I probably shouldn't go that far. And I should probably, you know, plus up another operator or two, you know, if, if we're going to do that Uh, and then just going, nah, we got this. Uh, And, uh, and, and, and we did not. So I, I I got shot. Um, I, our combo guy that was with us got shot. Uh, I I got hit by a grenade about five seconds later after getting shot. Um, another round uh, skipped off and uh, shot my nods in half. So my panos were dangling on my face. Um, just shot up and in a and in a really bad way, and and really l- lucky lucky to get out of there. Um, and but we did. And it 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 didn't it didn't change me to to um, to being like hesitant or scared. Uh, I truly think it 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 reset me to exactly where where right. I needed to be. Right. Um, I I don't think I would have ever operated scared. It's just not who I am. I, I if if I think I couldn't have got out of that, I'd I'd have just medically retired at that point. I just ref, you know that's just not how I'm cut. So I, I either just would have been like, well, I, I lost it and it's not for me. But, uh, you know, the whole time that I was in rehab, I could not wait to get back on the battlefield. I couldn't wait. Um, I, don't, I know it sounds 
may be weird to some people, but I couldn't wait to kill someone again and to prove like, hey, that's not how my career ends. There's no way that, you know, I felt like my career would end it on a mistake. So right, I right. worked you know, as hard as I possibly could to, to get back out there and then to, uh, you know, I don't know, validate myself still. Uh, I don't you know the right way way to kind of describe it. But that small reset, if I would have continued down that path, I would have died in Syria. One one hundred percent. That Syria was such a different, uh, such a different game. Uh, you you think you know IEDs, you know, in Afghanistan, you, you don't you don't know what it's like until ISIS retreats from a village and leaves about three thousand IEDs everywhere on every road on every courtyard in the walls of houses puts them on timers puts them on ir trip devices just an absolute ied debacle um and and they were more than and they were smart like they were they were more than willing to uh to um use your griff your aggressiveness against you and pull you into situations uh on, only to only to find out too late. Uh, yeah, we may have that. That's that's what they wanted us to do. Right. Um, ISIS really was a, a formidable enemy, and in some aspects, um, and in other aspects, they're they're just as dumb terrorists like the rest of them. So they're they're definitely a, a, a dynamic there with ISIS. But yeah. I hate man. I really did. I I really hated ISIS on a on a level that. At the end of the day, I kind of respected the Taliban after operating in Iraq. Uh, guys in Iraq were just so quick to to surrender, you know, at times and just and just take their uh, take their chances with the judicial system. Um, at least in at least in Afghanistan, generally speaking, uh, they were willing to to fight it out with you. Um, and it was almost more like a, a tribal war as well. Like I don't know. I don't, I, again, I'm not going to sit here and give too much too much respect and credence to the Taliban as if they're some sort of l legitimate government, you know, fighting for their existence and they're, they're, they're horrible people, but compared to ISIS, uh, they, you know, I, I can, I, I view them in, in two, two different categories. Yeah. The, 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 ta the Taliban period. wasn't so much into like the flagrant war crimes and stuff like that, that ISIS was. Yeah, I mean they they had it, you know. Yeah. I mean they were they were capable of it, but they they the the amount when ISIS was willing to do it, they were willing to do it often and do it on a very large scale, right? And uh, and they were and they were willing to do it, you know, to kids as as much as anyone, right? And they were they were just they're just a different breed of evil, and I I I, don't, I, I remember you know seeing. Uh, you know, seeing ISIS dead bodies and just looking down on them with absolutely no remorse or yeah, no, yeah, yeah. you know, in internal struggle going, man, that was someone's son. You know, that was someone's father. But just looking at them and absolutely not caring and being like, that's just a two legged dog. You know, wish wish there were more next to him. I just really dislike them on another yeah. level. Well, could, could we talk a little bit more about uh, Syria? Because you mentioned that that was like a totally different environment. Um, and you guys presumably working with the SDF and it, it, was it more of like a, a UW environment than some of the other deployments? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, that was an SF mission all day long. That was an SF mission. Um, we, we had way too few guys doing way too much, um, you know, and for people who really aren't set up to partner with, with, <laughs> with other units, um, it, and I will tell you why SF didn't get that mission. And they wanted it. Fifth Group wanted it so bad. In fact, there was a plan to give it over to them. Uh, when we got to Raqqa, we were going to hand it over to them. Um, and then cooler minds prevailed. So I was like, it's a horrible idea. Like, that's like, it's like handing it over, at, you know, at halftime. They either take it over now or, or they don't take it at all. Like, don't, don't, don't. Don't turn it over to them to them right as they are getting to the you know the, the, the climax and and need and you need to be a well oiled machine right. fighting their capital at you know at the at you know, the most and then um you know and then give it to a new guy to figure out all their all their all their initial problems. The reason SF didn't get it is because SF 
the same reason I started to not like SF at the end. They quit trusting their ground guys. They required too much um, oversight, and that that war was going too fast. If you if to, to slow them down with the the protocols that that they would inevitably do. Um, so uh, the unit does a great job at trusting their ground guys. The, yeah, I, they yeah. I never never had an issue. Uh, you know, being questioned or asking why am I doing this or why do I need that? I just tell them what I'm doing and I tell them what I need. And, uh, you know, and, and if you don't give them a reason, you know, to, to, uh, to question you, they, 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 they never will. Um, and so the, my, my first trip was very, was very unique because it was, it was still, I wouldn't even call it UW. Like it was, it was, it was closer to, to World War II, um, like, you know, we had, you had friendly lines, yeah, yeah. you had enemy lines and there was, there was, there was, there was no in between, you know, and, and even weirder than that at times, it was like, you know, we called it a banker's war. Like no one, no one fought at night. They didn't, they didn't have night vision, you know? So, the, you know, when the sun went, came up and everyone woke up and, and, and ate some breakfast, they started lobbing mortars. You know, and, and right before dinner time, when everyone got hungry, they, you know, they they packed it up and and uh, you know and and waited for the sun to come back up. Um, that's yes, yeah, that's, that's a a little bit of a you know satire way to to describe it because it was very unlike that at, at times. But there is there there is a lot of truth uh, to to that as well. Um, there were times, you know, if you were to you know, ha have a fire or, or even a loud generator. Like it, it would, it would, it would get you some, some mortar rounds at night. I mean, they, they would come out and play at night if you gave them a reason to, but generally speaking, if you didn't give them a reason to, um, they were just, it was just a very much a, uh, this is the good side. This is the bad side. They're in this village. We're in this village. There's two clicks of open ground between the two villages and uh, we're going to fight it out to see who who's either going to lose this village or gain this village. And uh, for us as as a sniper, it really pushed us to um, to lean heavily into uh, what, what you know we started to call at the time ELR, extreme long range, because everything at the time was 800 meters and in, you know, 800 meters if you're lucky with a 308. Well, 308 wasn't going to do anything, you know, from 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 2,000 meters away. But that's where our engagements are, and so now we're now we've always had 338s, but we never really dusted them off and used them with a lot of, you know, extremely at you know at at these uh, engagements. And now, you know, we're finding out, you know, we the way we we use our yeah. I would have a a tripod. And a you know and a, a pillow for my uh, for my laser rangefinder, like things that I never had to do before. But you know, uh, you know, I would I would have a you know three thousand dollar really right stuff tripod just just for my laser rangefinder, because comes to find out, you know, at twenty two hundred meters away, if I'm just a little bit off. And I lays the you know the building in front of the building right. I'm I'm you know I'm trying to get, you know I'm off you know I'm off by by 50 meters and in, in that 50 meters now my elevation is drastically different, and I'm never going to hit my target at 2,000 meters even though that you know that three through eight is more than capable of making a 2,000 meter shot, so, um, I either just excited a lot of some of some of your nerdy shooter audience, or I just put to sleep some of some of the guys who just like direct action. Uh, we learned a lot uh, about our equipment and about our guns in Syria. It was a very very different war. And do you find uh, the three three eight once you guys dialed it in that you guys were pretty effective uh, using that weapons platform at those ranges? Yeah, oh that, that three. Three was great. It was uh, the the one thing that we we would go back and forth is when you get over two thousand meters. The problem we'd run into is spotting your misses. Mm. Even though you think the three three eight is is a, is a large round, man, it it, it is. Um, but you can easily not see a miss at two thousand meters. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't see your miss, 
then you, know, you, right. you can keep throwing rounds all you want, but now you're just, you know, trying to get lucky. Um, and even though the 50 cal is not as accurate as a 338, um, at least you can see your misses. And it's, you know, especially if you put like a Rafis round, you know, inside mm -hmm. there, um, you can, you know, you can see your, your misses in that environment becomes a lot easier. And even though it's not as accurate, um, you know, I, I at least can, you know, can make a uh, an informed decision on, on a correction, which right. I just couldn't with a 338. Right. And did the... It the, really changed, changed the way we operated a lot from long distance. Did, yeah. Did the, the, the reliance on the sniper platforms have to do with uh, the um, air support not being as quick as it was in Afghanistan or Iraq? Uh, no, we... Uh, we we were the only game in town, so we always we, we always got the uh, you know kind of got what we wanted. Um, it, it has more to do with guys hanging out in the windows or hanging out, you know, or or being under underneath structures that an aerial you know platform isn't really going gotcha. to be able to to see uh, as well as someone from from, uh, from a ground level. Now, did you guys uh... and and if, and if I called in an airstrike, I really have a hard time saying that's my kill. So I'm at least going to try to couple throw rounds at it before I call in an airstrike. Yeah. Now between the three three eight and and uh, the uh, the fifty, did you guys experience experiment all with like the three hundred wind mags or anything like that? To, you know, for that that sort of medium range type of. Yeah, the, the 300 wind mag um, just w wasn't uh, a platform we used, and, and no no particular reason. Uh, you know the you know the, the SF groups, to my knowledge, I think were the only ones that used that 300 wind mag, um, and it's a great round. I mean, it's a laser of a round. I mean, the 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 um, ballistics of that round is is absolutely great. It doesn't have a great uh, barrel life to it, and unfortunately, the the SF groups purchased that. And they didn't do a good job of having a like kind of a barrel replacement plan. So they mm -hmm. actually had a great. They probably had one of the great medium range or one of the best medium range long guns in the arsenal for for anyone. But with uh, most of the barrels were shot out. And yeah. They ended up not as 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 great as they should have been. Yeah, because I know some that's something the seals use quite a bit, and and they seem to ver be very happy with it. Uh, do, do they use a 300 as well? Uh, I I believe so. They they use it in their sniper school. I know so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we didn't even. We didn't even. The only thing we even used. I went to group Sodic and, um, uh, and level one Sodic. Um, gosh, I, I got to think of what's, uh, Sifsic or Sifsic, if you will, um, special forces sniper course. Uh, and we only use 308s, you know, at, at, at or, yeah, that time. Yeah, 308. Yeah, not 338. 308. Yeah. I don't know why I said 338. So as uh, as these, depo uh, you know, you're you're going back and forth from Syria. I mean, how did you see the, the campaign evolve over time? The the campaign was, was pretty straightforward, really. You know, even though we, we handed off to, to other squadrons, you know, they it, it was they really, you know, um, encountered the same things we did and and you know worked very similarly so really it was just like you know when you come in and out it was just you know, it's just picking back up where you left off um i in between in between rotations um i missed the the uh the fall the fall of raka so i'm sure that would have been uh, a lot different and i'll tell you why i feel like it's a lot it was a lot different um because when I showed up to Raqqa, like very shortly after the fall of Raqqa, I remember driving around that place at night, feeling like I was at the, you know, the opening of, of Terminator when there's just yeah, yeah, bombed yeah, yeah. out buildings just everywhere in this like, dark, smoky atmosphere. I've never seen um, damage at, at that scale to, to a city the way we leveled Raqqa. We absolutely leveled Raka, and rightfully so. Yeah, and I, I have to ask too. While we have you here, I mean, did you have any involvement in the Baghdadi raid? No, that that was the very first uh, deployment I missed. Gotcha. And uh, so hit Raka, and uh, what happened from there? I mean, uh, you, you said that you you actually went into the city at one point. Oh yeah. Well, from um, uh, 
from there, we went back into a more uh, traditional um, uh, kind of high value target right, hunting. Right. So the 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 war, the traditional war was over, um, and then that that kicked off uh, a much more fun part of of Syria, where we we went back into uh, into stri- quick strikes and a lot of them, and and, and had a and had a great time. That that was probably my my, my most enjoyable. Uh, trip would have been after the fall of that and uh you know some of those guys pretending like they can just put down their guns and <laughs> melt back into the population and and uh and the kurds will just forget about them um nope the kurds didn't forget about you uh and they <laughs> and they told us where we're at <laughs> and, and, and these are the uh, uh, from the outside looking in the occasional like CENTCOM press reports that somebody flew in in black helicopters in the night and hashed out <laughs> business with the bad guys it, yeah, yeah, it it, it, it happened a, a, a lot more than uh, than press than the press, press releases. Would be honest, I would, there was no need for the press to get wind of, of of any of it. What what was that like for you and and you know your fellow soldiers in the sense of there there was you know the press might report on it occasionally like we had just had these two very long wars right that were in and out of the media but. But there was a national awareness about it. But then Syria comes, and and it's not in the national consciousness the way these other wars are. But we have troops that are fighting, same as we do in parts of Africa and stuff. But what was that like for you guys? Uh, I welcomed it. I, you know, I, well, I shouldn't say I welcomed it. I, at, at the time, I didn't know about it. I mean, really. Like, you know, when you're in that world, like, I don't – if. I don't know what the the news is reporting on or what they're not reporting on. You know, I, I live in a very, I lived in a, in a very, uh, in, almost in, in a bubble, you know, yeah, um, do your job, so, go home. You're right. Yeah. Do your job, go home. And when I'm home, I'm, I'm training for my next job, you know, so I don't, you know, I don't have time to listen to see what, you know, to see if the, what the news is reporting about Syria. I, you know, I, I, I live it in Syria. I don't, you know, I don't necessarily, the, the only time I would see anything on the news is someone like, you know, showed it to us and say, Hey, this is, this is what they're talking about. Um, or if something got leaked, you know, if something got leaked, we, we'd always, you know, we'd always know it. You know, they, they'd always, uh, you know, show it to us that something got leaked and try to, um, so like those, but those are, those are far and few between. Would, would, would they try to like, like scare you guys straight, find out who did it? Like, no, most uh, most of the time, uh, those those leaks would uh, would have come from um, a partner force, or um, you know someone um, someone at a at a much you know higher level in the military that that they you know they knew was way yeah it's you know, not way, some way E seven yeah rank. it's just somebody in the three X or <laughs> that's right yeah yeah it's yeah it's not even someone JSOC related yeah you know, it, like it's someone that's yeah at a at a at a theater like CENTCOM level that has a relationship with Fox News and 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 leaked it, you know, it's, that's usually where yeah, you know, some, you know something along those lines. Yeah. So uh, from that time period, uh, is there any other like significant missions that kind of stand out for you? Um, I won't I won't go into great detail about it and i don't mean to, to do that as a teaser but I'll, I'll i'll say this more or less to kind of set the record straight on it um it's another thing that it's it's funny what what does get news traction what doesn't get news traction um what sh- should have been a a much bigger story and was it and i'll talk about it because like i said you you can google it um you know john dunbar you know dying in syria um and uh and Matt Tonro, which was a British SAS guy, which was right next to him when he died, should should have been a huge news story. You know, if you think about it, I mean, you got a, a Delta Force guy and a British SAS guy dying on the on the same target. When has that ever happened? You know, that's that's um, that that's a, that was crazy. That's never happened in in the history of of either one of our uh, of our existence. Yet in Syria, that was without a doubt a first. Um, but that ended up being a bigger news story in Syria. I mean, uh, in in England, because uh, yeah. you know we had told our people that we, you know, we uh, that we obviously have you know ground troops and combat operations happening in Syria. Um, they were 
they they weren't as forthcoming uh, with it with the SAS. Right. Right. Uh, and so when the news so when the news hit that an SAS guy died in Syria, um, you know, a lot of the public was like, "Whoa, what's going on here? You didn't you guys said that we were kind of there in a support role. That doesn't seem like a support role." Um, one of the the worst misconceptions of that uh, of that um, of that mission is that uh, newspapers reported that it was that it was fratricide that that killed him. And I it's do remember something about just, that. It, it, but it was it an IED, wasn't it? And there and there is a problem with it. Like you use terms like IED, which you're right, but but people assume. You know, like, like roadside bomb IEDs, because that's what you know. When you talk about IEDs, is what you know. It's what what you know. What what, what it almost always is. Uh, we were dismounted at the time, really close to to target, uh, to a, a bomb maker's target. Um, he had a he had early warning, and his uh, a uh, like an, an IED make, makeshift claymore went off, and uh, uh, John took the brunt of that. But it set off his wall charge, um, and his wall charge is what is what killed Matt. And that is and that story, you know, that story is out there. Oh, but generally speaking, it'll say, "Hey, uh, it was a fratricide, and you know, he died due to a friendly explosion." They'll they'll say it in, in ways that that are that kind of really. Um, yeah, it's a sympathetic explosion. It's not yeah. Fratricide. Jump around the yeah. truth. Yeah. But, I don't even like the way they say that because so let's it would be like writing a story and saying, um, you know, Sergeant First Class Smith died in Afghanistan due to a fuel, ex a, a gas tank explosion in his Humvee. Well, did the IED set off the right. gas tank right. explosion? Right. Yes. Well, but the gas tank killed him like that makes you know, nowhere in the history. Do, do we ever right. do right. we ever say that? I don't know the why why we do it here. Um, it, it was the direct cause of, you know, of, of direct contact with yeah. the enemy. newspaper stories were written. It, it, that's, yeah. That's said differently. That, that, that painted it, insinuated differently. Right. I just, it, it, it bugs it, me. It's sort of the way fact checkers work sometimes, right? Is, is, is they, they, I mean, technically what they're saying that it was an American explosive that killed them is true, but they're miss, but, but they're leaving out really how it all went down. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's one, it's it, one way to say Yeah. It. It's, it's sort of like saying that somebody who died from, you know, from enemy fire died from blood boss. It's like, yeah, they, they did die from blood boss. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's so true. But they and, didn't just uh, start bleeding. And like a, and you know they the the uh, I don't remember which newspaper, but you know the the um, the you know in, in England they they did like a whole investigation on it, and then you know wrote a report saying you know this is the official report you know off of it you know and sent it out as you know, as official record, and again, it's it's technically true, but I feel like it's it's wildly uh, misleading and does and doesn't do justice you know honestly right. to yeah. either one of the guys who were who were, who were who were, who were warriors. I mean, they were both truly, truly good men. Um, I'll tell you a, a story just real quick about Matt Tunro was an SAS guy. Um, that guy would, uh, he'd have to go on a helicopter every now and again and go, you know, and go visit, you know, other places where, where they were at. And if he found out that we were, we were going on a, on a mission that night, he would do everything in his power to get his helo to come in sooner or see if we would push the mission later because <laughs> he didn't want to miss a single target. He was absolutely addicted to going on missions. And, and I love that about him because, you know, that's, yeah, if that's, that's the way you want every, every one of your guys to, you know, to be. And um, so just, it's very unfortunate that, uh, you know, that he, he lost his life in, in Syria and, and in that manner. Because he absolutely was uh, uh, represented his his unit. You couldn't do a better job of of uh, representing those guys. And so, how did um how, how did this this start to like wind down for you? I mean, it sounds like you really like rode this wave throughout your career, did some amazing things. Um, 
and, and you ha you had a, a great you know twenty years in the military. I mean, what what was it sort of like for you? Like you you must have some inkling that like this is coming. I'm not going to be able to be an operator forever. I mean, what, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, I mean, I was I was deep in my 30s and you know almost you know a decade at the time on on a team. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which my, my team time was was coming to an end. Um, the uh, what what really you know kind of did it for me was you know after that after that Syria trip we had we had been uh, we were we were doing training the way we always do training, um, and uh, I I was just unfortunate enough to be close to a couple of really big kind of training explosions that 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 just really they they really rocked me. Um, and un unlike earlier, you know, there's, you know, I'd been near those, those size explosions before, but for whatever reason, you know, at this point in my life, you know, maybe it just finally shook something loose. Um, I was, I was having some, some, some real, some real issues. Uh, so we'd, we'd get, and, and what would happen is almost every time we'd go back to, to do an explosive training, like these, these mental issues would, would, would rear back up almost mm -hmm. like, 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 like a re-injury of it. Um, it would get to a point where like just simple stuff, like I, you know, I'd have to, I would, I would write notes in my, in my locker to tell, to tell me where I parked my car because I would just go wandering out in the parking lot and looking for it. And it's a massive parking lot. And, and I, and I feel like the first time it really felt odd to me because usually when you see your car, you're like, Oh, that's right. That's, that's right. That's where I parked my car. But like to see the car for the first time, be like, that's not, <laughs> did someone move my car? And literally going in there and starting to accuse, you know, hey, who moved my car? Like I was parked, you know, at the right. And like, Brent, no one moved your car. I parked right next to you. That's where you parked this morning. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and trying to play it off. And, you know, it, I, I mean, I can go on and on and on. But one of the, you know, the, the weirder stories is, you know, go, you know, taking the taking the wife and kids to church. And just driving, and at some point, you know, yeah, you know, having you know your wife put you know her hand on your hand, and be like, "Do do you know where we're going?" I'm like, "No, uh, no, I don't know where we're going right now. Like, we're all dressed up kind of nice, and so I'm going to guess we're going to church. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know what day it is. I don't know where we're going. And uh, and I was my wife's like. You're, you're gonna go talk to someone Monday, or or I will. And uh, I was, um, and my my team time was was I, I was within yeah you know, I had one more deployment left you know really I mean I was, um so it was it 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 felt right yeah and um I felt I felt complete with my career I mean really Syria was great man I loved Syria, um, but when I got home from that last trip I I don't you know just something clicked I was like you know what. Uh, you know, every trip I couldn't wait for the next one. And it's not that I didn't, you know, didn't have the hunger, didn't want to wait, for, you know, didn't want to deploy again, but there was a feeling of, of completion, you know, there that had just never been there before. So when it was all said and done, uh, uh, it wasn't, uh, it, to be honest with you, it wasn't, it wasn't the hardest transition. It was at first, you know, realizing it's time, but as we started making steps towards that, uh, I was, I was kind of excited about, uh, what you know the, the next chapter in life that's awesome do we have uh do we have questions for brent uh we do um uh, I, I just wanted to say also that uh air tags i put an air tag in my car it it, wor it works wonders <laughs> yeah 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 um let's see here jackson thank you very much uh was attending selection for the unit more challenging coming from guard sf is guard sf well represented in the unit and also how often do you see marines airmen and sailors at the unit that's that's a good question um i i was surprised at, at how many other 20th group guys were there um there there was a there was a period of time where the the highest uh um it was a, a short period of time but, but it, it it fluctuates that 20th group had one had the best uh, uh, success rate at selection, um, so uh, yeah, it's, there's there's definitely no shortage of, or at least at that time, you know, of of guard guys. Um, 
And there's, you know, there's an eclectic mix of, uh, of guys in the unit. Yeah. At the end of the day, it'll always be heavy with green Berets and Rangers, but there is, there's someone from everyone there. I'll just, you know, leave it at that. I won't necessarily talk about the percentages of, of all of them, but, uh, they're, they're, they're all there. They, and they definitely all show up to selection. Um, and Jackson, thank you very much. How different are the cultures between the squadrons? Um, Oh, that's that's uh, that's a that's another good question. Actually, it when I first got there, the um, uh, the cultures were were I won't say drastically different because the the truth is, if you went back a little bit further when I was there, some people would say they were drastically different. Uh, when you know uh, when I got there, there was there was still. Um, very very different they all had their their uh their own personalities uh and and sometimes for better or worse um and uh by the, by the really by the time of uh, by the time i got to the end of my career a lot of those uh i would probably say more on a negative you know those negative type uh cultures just uh, had had pretty much all but all but disappeared and uh even though there are still slight differences be between the, the squadrons it, it, it wasn't as much as it used to be. Um, and then how do you feel about, how did you feel about uh, dev group and HRT when you were in? Uh, I, I, I didn't feel about them. Uh, Joe's. Who, who, are, who, who are they? <laughs> I think I read kidding. a book I'm about the kidding. second one. <laughs> um, the, uh, we had a, we had a lot of interaction with uh, with the dev group guys, and um, yeah, I've I've done, you know, I've done you know large scale training exercises with them. They've you know they've come over in a large trail, you know, they've, you know send onesie onesie twosie guys or, or a team over to do large scale training operations to get that uh, that crossover. Um, and we'll just say in various places around the world, I've I've had uh, one or two of their guys uh, attached to us. Um, so they could get you know experience of where we're at, um, and they were always good guys. They really were. They were always good guys. Um, HRT, I don't never, never, never saw them. They just you know completely different mission set. They're generally speaking, they're Conus. We're O Conus. Um, there, there was a time we had HRT guys kind of attached to us, but when they were attached to us, they were just evidence collectors. You know, they they weren't they weren't shooters by by any stretch of the imagination and nor, and nor could they be, they, you know, they haven't gone through our level of training. Uh, Joe's got you. Thank you very much. Uh, did you work a lot with 22 SAS while deployed? I think we got that one. Yeah. I think we kind of got that. Yep. Uh, dog yep. point. And there, there's a, there's another one. And I'll just tell you just a, a, a quick story of how much respect we have with, with, uh, with the SAS, you know, obviously we were modeled after those guys, um, they they helped us out a lot with our tactics in the beginning. And by the beginning, I mean talking like 1977. You know, Charlie Beck with uh, Founder Days, and that type of uh, relationship has has maintained for for 40 plus years. So, um, I mean, I'll make up this you know this fictional scenario, but it's but it's absolutely true. If I was in Syria and some you know, and heck, I'll make it close to home, a Green Beret, a Green Beret comes and knocks on my door, and we're like, hey. You know, heard who you guys are. Just want to come over and say hi. I'd be like, uh, "Go walk forty miles, and you can come back and say hi." <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, I'd say it nicer, but you know, but generally, you know, generally speaking, that's turn it around. Bring a foreigner to my door, a guy who's not even American, but make it a, an SAS guy come and knock on my door and say, "Hey, you know, hey mate, you know, I'm I'm with the the two two. I was told to come say hi." I'd open that door as fast as I could and bring him right on in. Invite him for a spot right. of tea. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the the, the relationship the, the the two units have are are are, are great, and I'll, I'll I still talk to some of those guys. Great, great guys. Um, Dog point. Thank you. Uh, what do you like about your squadron? What was the vibe like? Any funny stories? Um, <laughs> uh, there's. <laughs> There's always it, it. It doesn't matter what part of this business you're in. You know, you work with the funniest guys you've you've ever been around. You know, and I don't care if you're a SEAL, Green Beret, Range. I don't care what you did. 
you're just hanging out with the funniest guys you'll 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 ever work with. Um, you know the the vibe of my squad, you know, I think was a very was a good middle of the road vibe. Like we we uh, we were very we were very professional when needed to be, and um, you know could could kick back and, and relax when when needed to be. I think other squadrons at times did uh, were too professional and weren't very fun to be around. And, uh, you know, some of them were, uh, you know, were a little bit more, I don't know, say, we'll say cowboyish. But I don't, I don't mean to say that unless, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a bad light. Uh, but I think we had a good balance of, uh, of both. And so I, I really in, in, uh, enjoyed, enjoyed the culture of the squadron I was in. So Goldilocks uh, would find you guys just right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nick TCH. Well, this is actually for Jack. Will uh -oh. Mike Perry ever return? Uh, Maybe. Yeah. If he wants to, sure. We'd love to have him back. Uh, Dano, uh, not Mike Perry. Yeah. Yeah. Mike first, Perry? first group. Oh, Mike yeah? Perry. Oh no, I'm saying platinum. Okay, no, the the bare knuckle fighter, Mike Perry. Not not that Mike Perry. Okay. Uh, um, Dano, not in Lions Den. Uh, thank you. Uh, Delta leads the way. Big PP, eighty second, Puke and Dragons. Uh, it was Thanks. just a comment. Yeah. Um, and then. Uh, hmm. So Joe's got you. Thank you very much. Um, you can talk or not talk about this, obviously. Uh, was your squadron involved at all with the battle of Kasham in 2018 against Wagner Group? Yeah, I was. Uh... Uh, I, I was in Darzar. It was uh, it was a good time. <laughs> uh, the, there's, there's there's a news article about it. You can read it. Uh, Dog point. Uh, thank you very much. When you went back to HVT raids in Syria, was it business as usual, or did you have to change it up? Oh, um, I, more or less business as usual. Um, you know the you know all the IEDs was you know definitely more of a thing on um uh you know that type of you know gaining ground conventional forces they're pulling back you know laying them all in they they still kept you know the knowledge uh of of that and some of the TTPs um but generally speak generally speaking it was back to business as, as usual um and I believe that is it. So tell us about FRCC and yeah. some of the things that you're involved in now. Uh, yeah. Uh, when when I got out of the, uh, the military, I had to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. Um, had no real, you know, solid plans. I, you know, I did a couple, like, uh, 1099 gigs contracting, but all Kona stuff. I knew I didn't want to go overseas and contract. Um, no, nothing against any of those guys who do, you know, I just, you know, it's not something that, that I was looking to to do. Um, had a couple former unit guys, uh, you know, start calling me up and be like, Hey, we're training a SWAT team here. I need an extra instructor. You want to come out? I was like, that sounds, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go, you know, hang out with SWAT teams and, you know, try to transfer some of this knowledge. That's really kind of very uniquely, you know, to us and kind of uniquely to uh, unique to SWAT teams. Um, because they, you know, they they deal with with barricaded shooters, active shooters, things like that 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 would happen on 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 our targets. And I really enjoyed sharing information with those guys. Like I really did. Like I, I got a, you know, I I felt like I, you know, every time I went and taught those guys that I I truly um, gave them the tools needed to be just as effective, if not more effective and to do business smarter to make sure that they can go home at night. Uh, and I'll never teach someone tactics where we're, we're, we're safety is somehow in like the, the, the lead uh, of, of, of a reason for, for teaching a tactic. Never, never, never a safety ever played a part on that's why we do this tactic. But if the effectiveness can stay 100% the same and there is the same end result that this guy dies yet i can increase your survivability yeah we'll 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 talk about that um and so i you know i got to i got to basically show those guys the lessons that we learned in blood like i i 
I really wish I could say that we're so much smarter at the unit than everyone else. And that's why our tactics are so much better. Um, we're we're kind of smart, um, but the unfortunate truth is we just get to see a lot more targets and we had to learn it the hard way like everyone else does. So we just got, we just get a lot more exposure to, to mistakes and to, and to doing things wrong. And some of those things, to be honest with you, it took us way too long to, uh, to, to change the way we do, we do business. Um, so uh, I'm really glad to be able to share that with those guys. That's something that eventually turned into uh, me and a SEAL Team 6 buddy. Uh, we're going to start or did start the beginning of a, a nonprofit to raise money for police officer, for police officer training. Budget is such, such a big deal to those guys. They have no budget. Mm -hmm. They want to train. Uh, you know, they, and sometimes they can get like equipment budgets and sometimes they have more equipment than you think they would, than that they would have because of certain grants, but training doesn't come along with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and some departments don't have the necessarily equipment either. Um, so it's a, it's really a diverse, you know, um, group of people you run into in, in SWAT teams. Um, and I'm not talking about your, your wokeness term of, of, uh, of diverse, you know, I'm talking about just the different, um, the different experience levels, the the different training, the different equipment. It's it's all over the place. Uh, so we were going to start a nonprofit. Uh, come to find out, I I don't like asking people for money, and that is a integral part of being a nonprofit. Right. It's much. It's a very. It's a key component. It's a key component to a nonprofit. Um. So. Uh, I ended up starting a, you know, starting first responders coffee company first, you know, that I'd, I'd much rather, um, you know, sell things, have an exchange for, you know, a, 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 you know, value for a product and then, you know, take, take the money we raised from that and, uh, and put it towards first responders. So we started with the coffee company. We started in November of last year. We've, uh, we've donated back a little over $20,000 uh, in, in less than a year. Uh, and, and the, and the truth is, uh, I, I love saying that number because it kind of sounds like a big number for a small business, but we, we get more requests than, than I could ever feel right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we won't be happy until we can stop telling departments that here, what we're doing and, and asking for help until we can fulfill all those requests. Um, uh, we will never be satisfied. Um, and so that comes into the, the next part of the business, um, you know, we could add another coffee line, which would take a lot of work and maybe add a little bit of revenue. Um, but uh, we, we decided on, hey, what if we added a whole new product, we can get into a whole new um, you know group of, uh, of purchasers. And so uh, we started First Responder Cigar Company in hopes of, of, of garnering a, a wider audience. And that's been great. That's been a I, uh, little bit of a, a selfish pleasure because I smoke two to three of my own stash every day and so i needed that at wholesale pricing <laughs> um but uh but besides that you know if you think half you know half of the country drinks coffee but it but it is a very you know um you know kind of convoluted market there's a lot of people fighting in that space right even though i don't you know could argue within first responders yeah you know, that's a there's there's a you know a multi-million you know uh, person audience that you know that that doesn't have a, a product, you know, kind of like ours catering to them. So, you know, we do have a nice niche cut out in that area, but a small percentage of people smoke cigars, but we're the only cigar, you know, we're the only, one of the very, very few American disabled veteran owned, you know, cigar lines. And then of course the only one doing anything for first responders, um, our cigar sales will probably take over our coffee sales in the next couple of months if it continues. I'll, I'll, I'll check you guys out, Brent, because we smoke cigars on the show. We have our humidor here. So I'll, uh, oh, yeah. I'll definitely check out you got, what you guys you got are doing. You got a box coming at you. All right. Well, well, we're happy to support the cause. And and we encourage everybody else to support the cause, whether it's for coffee or cigars. Or I guess you said whiskey, but I guess cognac would go better, right? First. Oh, there you go. Yeah. i yeah, I kind of have this FRCC, you know, uh, thing going. So maybe Coffee, first cognac, cigars, yeah. that Con works. Yeah, company. We'll, we'll work with it. We'll massage that. Um, but you guys can can find them at 
FRC uh, Coffee dot com. That's Foxtrot Romeo Charlie Coffee dot com. Check them out, and it's going to be in the link. Uh, it's going to be in the show description also um, down below. Um, and then also, uh, you started out as a guest on the Antihero podcast, right? And then kind of worked your way up just through sheer talent and charisma. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, he needed a co-host with a small vocabulary, and I was the clear choice. Uh, and um, you guys, yeah, uh, you can find the Antihero podcast on YouTube and also uh, um, on podcast platforms, right? Your your favorite correct. podcast. So tell us about that. Um, yeah, it it really coincides with the first responder uh, coffee company uh, story. Uh, I think um, if I remember right, the, a local news channel picked up a story about us, and I just got a random email from you know from a a small podcast, you know, saying, "Hey, well, I'd love to have you on the show. I'm a Orange County deputy, which is the the county I live in." So I was like, "Well, absolutely, I'll do a podcast with you. I mean, you're in my own backyard." Went over there, did a podcast with him. Uh, really enjoyed it. It was a good time. He's, he's a really good dude and, and a first responder. Uh, it was an easy conversation to have with him. Uh, he had me back on, you know, a, a couple more times. And, you know, and the times I was on was always the, you know, his, his bigger shows. Um, and, uh, I don't, you know, not to be edgy, but it's just true and it happened. You know, I, I, I ended up, I ended up saying something on a, a 30 second snippet on a podcast ended up into a much bigger ordeal i'll try to make it real quick um he just he asked me uh he he asked me some off the wall question on a on a first responder topic interview and he goes hey um well are there are there any secrets like you want to tell me about uh you know black ops and i was like no i don't really have any because to be honest with you most things get leaked so you, you probably know them all anyway. And then he randomly goes, did Rob O'Neill kill Osama bin Laden? And I just, I answered the way I kind of do in a team room. And I go, Rob O'Neill didn't kill bin Laden. It's the worst kept secret in all of special operations. And he cut that as a snippet and posted it as the promo. Although it had nothing to do with the, uh, with the, with the episode. <laughs> And it and it goes viral. Brent, you rabble rouser. And, <laughs> and, 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 and Rob O'Neill, did he actually respond to that? Or uh, so for anybody who's curious, you do have to check out like the full episode where you go into the weeds with it, which was episode thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. So the and the problem with that was it was cut as a teaser, an unintentional teaser. It wasn't so. It wasn't a teaser that was going to that was going to go into something more. That was it. That was just my comment about it. It goes viral and has, I don't know, between all of them, a million views. And, and a lot of people were upset. They're like, you can't just say something like that and, and not back it up. And there was a lot of that. And, and a lot of people just upset that, you know, I would make such a claim without any, you can't call someone a liar and have no, you know, uh, you know, evidence to it. Um, so it, Took me a little bit. I was like, you know what? They're right. So I, I came back out with a two and a half hour podcast talking about this exact subject, taking open source information from from Matt Bissonette to uh, to your guys's podcast uh, to you know to um, uh, not not my normal star witness, but uh, um, uh, Osama bin Laden's wife, who was also in the room, actually makes a statement about what happened that night. Uh, Hate to hate to ruin a surprise ending, but everyone's story are all the same except for one. So everybody's lying, but Rob. <laughs> Every, everyone's no. Rob is the only outlier in here. <laughs> Everyone else has the same exact story about to what happened that night, uh, except except for the guy making millions off of it. I mean, words like stolen valor are being thrown. <laughs> around but I, I i don't know you can use your own words so yeah and I, I people should go check out that that podcast the deep dive that you guys did well and in the podcast in general because you guys cover a lot of really cool topics because you talk about i mean a lot of uh first responder stuff i mean 
and, yeah. and you so guys, I, I you guys call out bullshit where you see bullshit too. We we do, uh, but I invite. I told him, uh, although my my co-host Tyler really, uh, he has you know very like of a uh, you know he, he loves punk rock and he has that he likes that culture and he and he doesn't he doesn't mind mixing it up a little bit. Although ironically enough, uh, you know that that comment makes it looks like I'm um, I'm more than happy to stir things up, but the the truth is, you know, I stepped in it and then I had to own it. Um, and I, I I told you know the you know the antihero podcast when I came on at the end of the day, I really want this to be a platform where we can tell the stories of first responders that I just don't think get told and and and. And there's always going to be the, and we'll have those stories on. In fact, we have one coming, you know, tomorrow. A, a cop that got that that took around and you know got shot in the line of duty. Um, you know, that's very you know very unique to any profession. You know, there's cops getting shot all over this country, and it's a it's an epidemic, and it's and it's it's horrible. Um, but you know, those those stories are out there. But let me tell you, there are stories out there that paramedics and ambulance, you know, uh, you know, riders can can tell you that never get a voice and never get to tell, you know, it their side of the story. Mind. They yeah. see some of the yeah. worst stuff day in and day out. Kids and moms getting mangled in a car wreck, you know, on the way to, you know, on the way to school, just things that are, that are horrible. But, you know, they, you know, I, I just want to make, I want to get a, a, a platform out there to where all first responders, that's great. Uh, you know, can tell their stories. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, it's weird that the reporting on police shootings, sh police being shot, like it's gone way down, but police are like getting shot a lot out there right now. Two police officers in, uh, at, in, in Orlando just, just got shot a couple weeks ago. Um, and, and here's, and here's a, what's, a, I'll tell this, here's what's a really cool story. Usually when that happens, it, it or, however, it's, it's how it seems is, uh, you know, the suspect flees into a, a county or, you know, or an area outside the SWAT team's jurisdiction. So it's just, just, just the way it happens. Not, 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 not often enough does the local SWAT team whose brother and sister you just shot get to go take care of it. But that's exactly what happened in Orlando. This guy wow. holds up in a, in a hotel still within the Orlando city limits and the uh, SWAT guys go to work and, uh, uh, that that guy um, got got the good news that night. Um, I guess I'm assuming he resisted arrest or had a had a had a gun he shouldn't have. And um, you know, and the good news is he doesn't have to go through the court system. Um, he's already he's already uh, he's already got a sentence. And uh, I got to send those guys a whole box of cigars with a handwritten letter and it said, "Hey, you know, uh, you know, and enjoy this. You know, not you know, taking human life is obviously something you should." You should uh, should never be you know taken lightly, but that being said, not not everyone here d d deserves this life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave him just a, a, a long heart for, you know a heartfelt letter that said, like you know I've gone through doors. It worked out well tonight, but I know yeah I know what it feels like to not know how tonight's going to work out right before that door opens. Right. You know, and just you know some some real kind of intimate stuff about it. And uh, they loved it. They framed it. They smoke my cigars and, uh, you know, and, and they're back at it. Take, you know, removing bad guys from the streets, you know, every other night. And, and I love that about SWAT teams. Yeah. Brent, um, again, man, thank you for doing this tonight. And I just want to let people know uh, we'll be back Monday with William Osgood, who's a uh, special forces in Vietnam. And then next Friday, we're going to have Robin Horsfall on the show who was in SAS. Um, so we're really looking forward to talking to those two guys this upcoming week. Uh, Brent, any final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? No, I just I, again, I, I I couldn't be any more humbled. You guys have me on here and 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 thinking that uh, my story is interesting enough to to listen to me run my rap my, my run my trap for a couple. No, hours. you you, you really, were great, man. It was really fascinating, uh, and I, I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, we deeply appreciate your time. What uh, can yeah. are you on social media much? Can people follow you if they're interested? I, I, uh, some, some habits I, I didn't want to break. Um, the, the only social media I have is, is the business and, uh, and, and I keep it there. And I, I didn't even want to learn that part of social media, but, but I had to. There you go. That's cool. Well, people can go check that out. <laughs> so definitely, uh, check out FR, uh, CC first responder coffee company, cigar company, and soon to be cognac company. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> or Cerveza Company. You'll figure something out. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure, figure something out. Uh, and uh, check Brent out on the Antihero podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, like I said, hit us up when you're coming through New York sometime. You want to light up some stogies. We'll be around. Um, and everyone else out there, have a nice weekend. And uh, we will see you on Monday. Yep. And RS, thank you. Thank you. We just saw your donation. Thank you. <laughs>